All right. Looks like we are live here on Standing for Truth. And uh, real quick, before I give the announcements, let's get the appropriate template. There we go. There we go. So welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B, and I am your host and moderator for uh, tonight's much-anticipated debate between Charles Jennings and David Preston on James 2. Specifically, we are debating and discussing the important question, what is the best exegesis or biblical understanding of James 2? This is part two of a debate series between uh, David Preston and Charles Jennings, who are very uh, well-informed and well-educated on this topic of soteriology. So a month ago, we debated uh, specifically Old uh, Testament salvation. That debate was very thorough, very comprehensive. David and Charles both did a fantastic job. So please, if you have not yet seen that debate, do check it out. So this being part two, we are specifically focusing on James 2. As we know, a hotly debated uh, passage in the Bible, a very controversial uh, passage. And uh, I'm extremely pumped for this. I've been looking forward to this since we said it two months ago. It really shows how quickly time flies by. So with that being said, gentlemen, I want to start off with some introductions, kind of break the ice and get to know you guys a little bit, especially for any of our new subscribers to this channel. Uh, and anybody just kind of uh, getting to know this debate platform, we do uh, host debates on all sorts of topics. So why don't we start with uh, why don't we start with Charles? Um, Charles, how you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about your ministry, the Layman Seminary. Uh, I've been doing well, pretty well at least. You know, um, my name is Charles. Uh, I have an online ministry called the Layman Seminary. That's the short title of the YouTube channel. The full title is Layman's Online International Seminary. That's the acronym for it. My wife is in the chat. She's Filipino. She's my Adrian. You know, if I'm going to be Rocky, Rocky the underdog. But at the same time, she's more million dollar baby or Tatiana Ali, you know, type. So, um, you know basically that after this debate her and i will sit down and we'll talk about things you know she'll give me advice and things like that and that's what these debates should be a time for learning for us all so just don't give it a first listen keep going through it study it and try to improve on your own stuff if you got a debate in the future you got a teaching in the future and you don't take into account this information then shame on you god bless God bless. Thank you so much, Charles, for that introduction. I do have your relevant link uh, to your channel, of course, in in the description box for people to check out. So, uh, David, David Preston, you were just here about a week ago. Actually, you're getting uh, quite a few debates in there. It's good to have you back. Uh, David, a little bit about yourself and how you been. Donnie, greetings. And Charles, what's up, brother? I'm looking forward to tonight's debate. Doing very well. I'm out here in San Diego, California, specifically in Imperial Beach, the most southwesterly city in the continental U.S. I'm definitely looking forward to tonight's debate. Uh, it is a topic that is near and dear to me, just like all the other topics I've been debating. But this is one that I was introduced to at, at a very young age uh, or as an early Christian. Uh, tonight, I will be taking the side that in James 2, uh, it is speaking of actually faith and works for salvation. And I want to also make it very clear to the audience and to all the uh, SFT fans that I presently in this dispensation believe that we are saved by faith alone. So please understand that. I don't want to confuse any of you, but just understand if you, you need to watch part one, if you watch part one, you're going to understand a lot of where I'm coming from. OK, so have a little grace and mercy there on me. Uh, also, uh, just please understand that. Uh, I'm going to be speaking fast as I can in my opening statement. So if you need to slow it down, run around, but that's just the way it is. And, uh, um, you know, I'm going to give you as much awesome information as possible. And I'm going to do my very best to uh, deliver the truth. So, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Donnie. And thank you, Charles. 
Awesome. David, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it really is a privilege to have you both here uh, for tonight's epic debate again on James 2. So I do want to remind uh, anybody who's not yet subscribed, please do make sure to hit that subscribe button, especially if you enjoy debates. And, I, and by debates, I mean a lot of debates on all sorts of topics, creation, evolution, ancestry, philosophy, soteriology, nature of God, so on and so forth. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and also share around this content because the truth is so important. And one thing we strongly believe in here on Standing for Truth is critical thinking. And so one way we uphold critical thinking is by hosting so many awesome debates just like this one. So uh, I do want to go over the uh, format for tonight real quickly for everybody. And uh, it's going to be uh, very formal. It's going to be very comprehensive as with uh, part one here. We're going to be having a 20-minute opening statement. David's going to uh, kick us off with, with his opening statement. Then we're going to get right into a 10-minute cross-exam. So it's a fast-paced debate. And uh, it'll be Charles obviously cross-examining uh, David pertaining to his opening. Then we're going to get Charles's 20-minute opening, followed by David cross-examining Charles for 10 minutes. Then we're going to have 10-minute rebuttals from both gentlemen tonight, 10 minutes from David, 10 minutes from Charles. Then we're going to get into more of a uh, free-flowing discussion, less strict and structured um, you know, than the uh, cross-exam, just more of a free-flowing discussion for 30 minutes, then a five-minute closing statement, and then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have roughly a 25 to 30-minute audience Q&A. Please make sure you're tagging me with your questions. Tag me at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss them. The chat does oftentimes get very lively um, and uh, completely understandable. These are very important topics. So with that out of the way, we are just going to get right into it. Uh, David, we're going to hand it over to you and uh, take your time. You just let me know when you're uh, when you're good to go. I do see your slides ready to uh, go up on screen. Did you want me to? Yeah, stand by. Yeah, go ahead and share it full screen. And I'll just tell you when to hit. Uh, let me get my timer set. All right, you can go ahead and go full screen. I'll tell you when to start. OK, All right, stand by. All right, everyone, I'm just going to go in this. I'm not going to give any pleasantries or anything like that. All right, so hold up. All right. All right, let's do this. Faith go. plus, good to go. Going to start the timer. Faith plus works versus faith alone. The author of the book of James is James Zebedee. He wrote a letter to the rich and the poor of the nation of Israel after Calvary. James still maintained the Jewish teachings taught by Jesus that in order to gain eternal life, one had to keep the law of Moses. Leviticus 18.5. James even continued to teach that one's sins could be covered by performing good deeds. Nowhere in his epistle does he mention the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15. His struggles with the rich, ruling elite amongst the 12 tribes scattered abroad. The rich oppress the poor, meek, and are only hearers of the word and not doers also. Thereby they will not receive the crown of life, which is eternal life. James maintains that works are necessary to receive eternal life by pointing to the law and Abraham. James is seeking to prepare the 12 tribes for the coming of the Lord. James, uh, excuse me, Jacob's troubles are on the horizon. Therefore, Jewish believers were rightly expecting the Lord to return during their time, not 2,000 years later. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what I will be arguing today. Authorship. It is important to understand who was the author of this epistle. I take the position that James of Zebedee was the author. Most people take the position that it was James, the son of Alphaeus, or could be also, and I think it is also James, the brother of our Lord. However, I think the evidence points to James Zebedee. Usually the only reason why it seems like James Zebedee is not the one that authored it is because he said, it is said that he died too early. Um, in fact, I will make a point that, that that does not in any way hinder him from being the author. So I have eight reasons why I think James is the author. One, his position. His position in, in the group of apostles is very high at the uh, pretty much at the very top. As we know, he was he was one of the one of the three who was at the Mount of Transfiguration uh, when Jairus's daughter uh, was was healed. The maiden or brought back to life. Excuse me. Uh, he he was allowed to be in the group with Peter and John in the upper room. He was listed uh, as one of the first apostles. 
um, in, in, in order, Peter, James, and John. That was the usual listing of them. Number two, John and Peter were, um, along with James, were early off business partners or just partners, as the, the King James Bible says, when they were fishermen. So they already had a very close, uh, they were already close with each other. And from the very beginning, they were all they were with Jesus uh, in, in the early ministry uh, of Jesus on earth. Third, his personality. Uh, now, for those of you who know anything about the four temperaments, which I'm a big fan of, uh, I happen to believe that James most definitely would have been labeled as a choleric. Uh, we know that he was um, called by Jesus one of the sons of thunder. And we also know that his mother and also um, James and John asked to be on Jesus's right and left side when they were ruling and reigning over the kingdom. He was a fisherman, and I think that's important to understand because there is language within the epistle that speaks of a ship and seafaring. And while that necessarily may not be um, only maybe James and the others could, could apply to them too, but I think it means much because if he was a fisherman, it would be obvious that he would apply something that relates to his life. Also, lessons learned. We know that James was a, what we could say, a fire mouth. He had the ability to say things that, let's just say, um, he needs to tone it down and take it easy. So we know that in James 119 that he specifically points out that it is important to control your mouth and, and the dangers of having a dangerous mouth. So this is a lesson I see that him learn what he experienced while he was younger. Also in this epistle, Elijah is mentioned. Uh, um, excuse me. He mentions the story. Uh, sorry. And the story of Elijah, we know that when he went to the city and they rejected them, that he asked Jesus to basically do what um, they did in two Kings chapter one. And that's burned the entire city. And that's what he got corrected for. He got rebuked, actually. Uh, interestingly enough, James, James chapter five ends with Elijah, the story of Elijah. But this time it's, it's, a, it's a little more positive story with a happy ending. And so uh, there is a relationship there. Also, manuscript wise, this is very interesting. The Syriac and the Latin versions uh, point to uh, evidence that James, the son of the, the James of Zebedee, uh, wrote the epistle of James. I highly recommend you see John Gill's commentary. Now, John Gill does not agree with me, but he at least, and this is one reason, again, I, all, I love John Gill because he tries to show all the evidence. And he admits that, yes, there are early Syriac versions that do put in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the beginning that James, the, James wrote this epistle and he specifically say James, Peter and John, which were the ones on the Mount Transfiguration. If you take a look at the uh, Cyclopedia by James Strong, he lists some evidence from Latin versions and also from the Syriac. And last but not least, his death. His death will mean a lot because during his time, he was there was much persecution going on. And, and when you look at the letter of James, you will see clearly that there is much persecution going on. So the time period in which James died, actually James of Devity, does match also the time period, or does match much of the events that are happening within the epistle. Again, I understand this is this is not the, the popular belief. But I think there's more evidence to support that James of Zebedee is the author of the epistle and more evidence than than James, the brother of Jesus. Now, the audience, the audience is very clear in this epistle. Thank God. It's to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. James chapter one. Also, in, in, uh, in later on in James, it mentions the first fruits, which is very, very important. And I believe the first fruits is, is said in, James, in Jeremiah 2, 3, which says this. Israel, um, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. There we see that Israel is definitely his first fruit. So when we when we take a look at that, we can see there's um, much evidence that points that that is Israel. And so um, we go to number three synagogues. The word synagogue is used in this book. And it's important to understand also that his brother, when he wrote the book Revelation, I'm kind of divert here a little, he wrote to seven churches. The thing I'm gonna, I want the audience to understand is that churches is simply is, is a gathering place. It's not only applied to Christian uh, gathering locations, but it can also be applied to temples. And when, when a synagogue had a message to be delivered, it was usually spoken by the angel. That was the name of the person that act, that was the name of the title of the actual person that would deliver the message that was being handed ha handed to the synagogue and to the congregation. So when these when this epistle was going around the empire, it would be the, it would be handed to the, the to the angel of the synagogue, and the angel of the synagogue would therefore then read the message. Number four, the final instructions by Jesus match much of what James is teaching in his epistle. Num number five, the, the minister to the circumcision, like w was Jesus? Excuse me, Jesus was the minister to the minister to the circumcision according to Romans 15, 15, 8, only 
you have to understand that when Jesus was on earth, his focus was the circumcision, not the uncircumcision. James is in line with that. And again, the rich elite, as I said earlier, and then also the poor. The law of Moses. So let's try to define some of these terms because these are going to be very important within our debate. One, I believe the law of liberty is actually the law of Moses. And what I want, I want to read one verse in uh, Psalms 119. In fact, you know what, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read that. I'll read that later. But in Psalms 119.45, it makes it very clear. To, it, it links the law with liberty, the ability to be able to uh, do what you need to do. And you have to understand when Jesus in John chapter 8, when he said the truth shall set you free, he was referencing the law. So what I want people to understand in the context of where James was, the law wasn't a burden. The law wasn't chains. The law was liberty. And if you just read Psalm 119, you'll get you'll get the idea that the law definitely was a blessing, was a light, was something that gave them freedom and liberty. Also, the word law occurs 10 times within this within this epistle. And the idea of doer is very is very strong and matches Leviticus 18 and Matthew 19. Now, I want to address real quick the issue of keeping the whole law, because I'm sure someone in the questions might ask this. But you have to understand that when it talks about being the, doing the law and then saying that, well, if you break one piece, you break all of it. Well, understand this. That was already a common Jewing, a Jewish saying amongst those who believe you had to be saved by the law. Also, you have to understand that sacrifices were always in, integrated within the law of Moses. So it gave you the ability and already expected you that, yes, you're going to break the law. But if you do, here's, here's what you do if you do break the law. Also, I recommend that you take a look at Josiah and see how God describes him as him being the keeper of the law and understand that this idea of, you break everything. You're all sinner, and so the reason you're, you guys are so bad, you need Jesus Christ to come. Excuse me, fulfill the law for you. That's not the concept within James James's epistle. Coming tribulation. This is the context also within the book of tribulation. Uh, excuse me, in, in the book of James. Uh, now again, John, if it is James Zebedee, and I believe it is, his brother wrote the book Revelation. Both these gentlemen have an emphasis on the crown of life. The two, uh, from my understanding, they're the only ones within the quote unquote New Testament that mention the crown of life. And this is a very important concept because if we go back, like in my last debate, when I brought up Maccabees and this idea of martyrdom and dying for the law, it essentially gives you eternal life, according to 2 Maccabees 7, 9. Now, this concept within their within their worldview is extremely important and understand that when he mentions the crown of life, the focus is eternal life. Also, understanding that is this a, is this is this context about the, 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 the tribulation? I believe so. It is. If you look at Elijah, Elijah is mentioned, like I said earlier, and it's it, interesting enough that the, 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 the time period in which Elijah was talking about was three and a half years. Patience of Job is mentioned in James. Interesting enough, in, interesting enough, there's 42 chapters within the book of Job, much like three and a half years. Number four, Mosaic law, I believe, is enforced during Jacob's trouble. And last but not least, number five, is that the rich are most definitely given a very negative view in this book. And if you take a look at the book of Revelation, it is something that is to be looked down upon if you're rich, obviously, because if you're rich, that means you have compromised and you have the mark of the beast. Quickly, the Pauline revelation. I I'm, I'm want everyone to understand that, one, the body of Christ was not known while, while the epistle was written. Christ in you was not known. The role of the Holy Ghost, in which Paul reveals, was not known. And Acts 15 hadn't occurred yet. In Acts 15, we, dis we, we discover, finally, after so many years, that, guess what? You don't need to be circumcised, and you don't need to keep the law to get the Holy Ghost to be saved. That is, that is very, I'll get back to that later, but that is extremely important to understand. Also, Paul's letter was written post 15, post Acts 15 council. A few things to consider real quick are one, Genesis 12. Now, Abraham, I know that there's a lot of you have a misconception. You say, well, Abraham was saved by faith. So this is my reason why I'm, I'm when we go to Genesis 15, Genesis 15, since Abraham was saved by faith in Genesis 15, you're wrong, David. What I want the audience to understand is that. In Genesis 12, Abraham obeys God's voice. In Genesis, in Genesis 12, Abraham calls upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 12, Abram, um, sorry, Abram builds an altar to the Lord. In Genesis 14, King of Salem blesses Abraham, which is Melchizedek or Abram. In Genesis 15, finally we get there. It says, believe that God will multiply thy seed as the stars and sand. That is what he specifically was supposed to believe. Then his faith was made perfect, as James tells us in Genesis 22. Sacrifice his holy begotten son. Isaac, we know that didn't actually occur, but the idea is that his faith was made perfect. Also, what I find interesting is that this idea of, of, of 
faith and Abraham being used uh, is also used in 1 Maccabees 2.52. Obviously, we know that Maccabees does not promote a faith alone salvation. It definitely promotes a faith and works salvation view. But my, what I want the audience to understand is that this, this, just because you use that verse in ch chapter 15 is not necessarily trying to say that you're saved by faith alone. Number eight, Abraham is still in Abraham's bosom. Now, let's get to faith plus works. What I want everyone to understand is that chapter one of James uh, is repeated in chapter number two. Let me say that again. Chapter number one of James is repeated again in chapter number two. So to hear is to have faith. And we know that because um, we know that from Romans 10, 17. But when we take a look at James 1, 21 and Romans 2, 13, we discover but to do is to work. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to slow down a little with the few minutes I have left. And I want you to understand something that the concepts within in, in James chapter one, this idea of being a doer of the law and not a hearer only is also repeated, like I said earlier, in James chapter two. So we know that to hear is to have faith. And so in Romans, Paul is emphasizing this, this idea of to hear and to have faith. So then when we get to this concept of Romans 21, to be to be doers of the law and to be doers of the law, not hearers only. We have to understand that it is important to realize that faith and works is taught in James chapter one. So let me read now. Let me see here. OK, so I'm going to start off here with the few minutes I have left in James chapter. Keep keep the screen up. You don't need to show me James chapter one, verse twenty one. It says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with the meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word. And Paul says, be ye doers of the law. It's the same thing. It's the law of Moses. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For any for any be a hearer of the word and not a doer. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso lacketh, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the law of Moses, and continueth therein, he being not forgetful, hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now listen to this, pure religion and undefiled before God, and the father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, understand this, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the Lord of glory with respect to persons. For if there, there come unto your assembly a man, that's the synagogue, with a gold ring and a good apparel, and there come in also a, a poor man in vile raiment. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and saying to him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or, or, or sit here unto my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Let's move on. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and hires of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law, that's the law of Moses, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor in the law. Listen to this. So speak ye and do and, and so do as that shall be judged by the law of liberty, the law of Moses. For he shall have judgment without mercy and hath sued no mercy and mercy rejoices against judgment. What doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he hath faith? Have not works, can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food? And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to, to, to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead 
being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So we know the rest of the story, but what I want to, to, to emphasize is that, again, in, John, in James chapter 1, his focus is being doers of the law and not hearers only. There are rich people in the congreg in the synagogues that are specifically just hearers. That's it. They hear it. That's all they do. They don't they, they, they don't do anything. They don't follow the law at all. And what James is emphasizing, and this is probably eventually what gets him killed, is he's explaining to the rich elite, you have to be doers of the law. If you're not, you won't receive the crown of life. So let's move on to my next slide. I have a few seconds left. All right. So let's talk about the transition letter, the Roman theory. Now, this is not the primary focus of the debate, but I do want to mention this since I have a few minutes left. Is this Romans was written prominently to the to Israelites in Rome. This is my this is my theory, by the way. This is my opinion. This is all David. Trust me, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll concede that. The aim of the letter was to bring the followers of James in alignment with the revelation of faith alone and the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection taught by, only by Paul. James traveled around the Roman Empire, spreading the gospel of the kingdom. In his final days, he wrote a fury epistle to the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul needed to educate the Jewish believers once the mystery of the body was revealed. James was well established in Spain. Paul's mission was to start with Rome, the center of the empire, and visit the followers of James to instruct them in the better revelation. One, saints, I believe, is always a reference to, to believing Jews. Two, Romans 2.13, be you doers of the law and I hear his only. It must be uh, understood in light of, but now, Romans 3.21, which is, but now, the righteousness of God, you know, understand it doesn't come no longer by the law. Number three, both rely on the wisdom of Solomon and Ecclesiasticus, which, is, which, which are Apocrypha books. Four, both appeal to Abraham. Five, this is very important, both address the olives, figs, fines. Now, Romans 11, which is everyone thinks is this idea that Gentiles are grafted in. I do not believe that. I believe this idea of, of grafting in is clearly understood when you look at Matthew 21. And essentially that when you understand the concept between the poor and the rich, you understand who is the, who are the ones who are who are truly grafted in. Now, James 3.12 mentions the olive, fig, trees and vines. And six, both are connected with Spain. Oddly enough, I didn't know this, but. People believe that James is still at James's bones are resting in Spain. They believe that James Santiago uh, had missionary trips to Spain. Uh, there's even a, 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 a pilgrimage that's there. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not all into that, but it's interesting that history itself points this idea that James himself actually was buried in Spain. Now, Paul, we know when he ended his, uh, when he ended his letter to the Romans, specifically said that he wanted to go to Spain. I believe he ended up did going to Spain. There was definitely a connection. I think what Paul did in Romans was to say, hey, everyone, it's time to realize there's the new revelation I'm going to teach you. It's no longer by it's no longer by faith and works. It's by faith alone. Last, I got one last slide I want to share. And this is it. Again, I'll bring this up later on in the debate. But it's, it's, it's you got to get the understanding. You have to get the perspective of where we're at. As you can see, James and John, they were called around 80, 27. You can see Jesus dies in 80, 33. The promise of the father comes down on 80, 33. Saul's conversion is in 80, 35. James is beheaded, by the way, and 44. We know that because Claudius Caesar, his reign, it's mentioned in chapter 11 of Acts. Paul's vision of the gen of eat with the Gentiles is, is in uh, AD 41. Now the council is 17 years later after Paul's conversion, where they finally say, hey, you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to keep the law to, to, to get saved. And, and, and lastly, my, my final, final point is that the book of Romans was written at least in 60 AD. Everybody, you have to understand when we're going to debate tonight, the book of James, we don't even have any other book near us, not even close. So I, I, I urge my opponent to do his best to try to convince me that the Pauline revelation of faith alone is clearly in James chapter two. Thank you. Thank you, David uh, Preston, for that 20 minute opening statement. We are now moving right into a 10 minute cross exam where uh, Charles, you are going to lead the way. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, it's 90 degrees here. My wife said the fan was messing up the uh, mic, so I got that off. So if I get a little dizzy, you know. But um, what I want to ask you, David, is does one have to believe that 
James refers to the tribulation in order for you to hold your position? No. Okay. Second question. Um, do you, are you aware of the backdrop of the crown of life being related to the Isthmus games that claim at least? No, I mean, I heard about it a while ago, but no, I didn't go into it. Okay. Um, did you have an opportunity to read Dillo uh, on these sections? I didn't. Okay. Sorry, no, Charles. Yeah. No problem, man. We've been exchanging emails and reading stuff, and so I know how it is, man. Um, let's see. But can I say something to the James thing? And I don't oh, want yeah. to take your time. Yeah. Is that understand? I, I think I think James is is a. I mean, this this guy is a super Jew. So I mean, I, I would like to hear more about, and maybe later on the comments or something about this idea of the crown of life being taken from. Uh, you know, Greek, Greek, you know, the Greek practices. Um, I, I mean, it's possible. I don't, I don't see why not, but I, I think that's something that um, I would like to see more evidence on. So just because these guys were, a lot of these guys hated the Greek culture. And so, I mean, I don't know okay. if they would adopt everything from Greeks. Um, do you think that every time the word law occurs in scripture, that it always refers to the Mosaic law? No. Okay, that's good. But let me say this in regards to James. I do believe that when you take, especially Romans 2.13, definitely is quoting James. I do believe that that's, that's one of the best ways to just signify, like he's talking about the law of Moses for sure. Okay. Do you believe that scripture ever teaches uh, the quality aspect of eternal life? Using my categories, an experiential use. Okay, good. I'm glad you asked that. Um, yes, it does. But again, what I believe is that the idea of positional, experiential, and ultimate, I see those as great concepts, but I see them under the Pauline revelation. I do not see that in the Old Testament, and I do not see that in James and Peter and John. Okay. Um I guess I guess I need a little bit of background. Can you uh, read to me uh, First Maccabees? Well, can you read uh, Maccabees two seven and nine? Yes. Okay. Okay, Maccabees two seven and not seven nine. Uh, it says. Uh, Maccabees 279. Mm -hmm. That's the one you gave, right? The passage. Uh, I hope I hope it was. Yeah, he said, Woe woe in me, wherefore was I born to see this misery of my people? No, I gave you another one. Okay. I'm sorry, I wrote it down. No, I'll, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it for you. But yeah, keep going. Keep going though. Don't stop. All right. The other one I want to know about Ma from Maccabees is first Maccabees 252. Okay. First Maccabees 2.52 says, um, oh, yeah, this is a good one. Was not Abraham found faithful in temptation, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness? Do you believe I, that Scripture teaches the possibility of imputation of experiential righteousness? Uh, no, not in the Old Testament. Yeah, no. Okay. All right. Um, but again, if I can go back, um, and I'm— if those listening, you're definitely going to have to go back to part one. Um, I do think, though, that Abraham did not necessarily, like, he did not experience, his experience isn't the same as our experience, and that Paul used him as an example, just like Maccabees uses him as an example. Obviously, the writer of Maccabees doesn't believe in faith alone, but they're trying to teach a concept about imputation, and we think, like, oh, everything is automatic back then it, it wasn't and that's one reason why i had to fly by the pauline revelation is there's a lot of things in the pauline revelation that aren't that that weren't even known were the body of christ wasn't known i, I challenge anyone I'll give me two billion dollars anybody if you can prove that that the 12 taught um that the body of christ taught the body of christ but anyways so those are things that we need to understand 
Abraham is not saved, quote unquote, like we are today, but there are similarities. And understand that prior to Gen prior to Genesis 15, we have to explain him calling upon the name of the Lord. He already had a relationship with God. I mean, he was already that he was already tight with them. I mean, so yeah. Sorry. Um, do you believe that uh, Abraham's salvation from hell was recorded in Scripture? Uh, no. Okay. No, but I, I mean, I believe I believe Abraham's bosom is was you know I think I think that's where he's at right now presently. I don't think any of the Old Testament saints were res are, were resurrected and they're all still there waiting. Okay, and uh, how does that relate to how you view salvation in the book of James? If, if it's possible to at least allude to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So my understanding is that because the cross didn't occur yet, okay, that those underneath the, the, the Old Testament covenant uh, were set, had to go to another place. They have to wait. They're not going to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit automatically and permanently. That is huge. Again, I'm, I pointed out that one of the things, especially Titus 3, 5, there was no regeneration. Abraham was not regenerated by the Holy Ghost. And when he, when his, when he died, he had to go to a resting place below our feet. And he's waiting for, I believe, the great white throne judgment. And he is going to pass. He's going to go through. But ultimately, he has to be judged. We know that after this, the judgment. So they're going to be judged, and he hasn't been judged yet. So I think that's important to understand uh, and understand that in the context of James, James is still in line with what Jesus taught on earth. Paul hadn't even shown up yet. Acts 15 hadn't even occurred yet. Okay, I'm using this time to get to know your overall belief. Um, so... In Ephesians, how do you understand lower lower parts of the earth? Uh, just exactly what it says, like as far right. as where, like, Go like ahead. so, and as far as where Jesus went, is that what you're asking? Yeah, does that refer to him descending into hell, the heroin, the hell uh, idea, or uh, where he evangelizes? All, all I know, all I know is, all all I know is that. The concept of hell, the word hell itself, is misunderstood today. Hell is a helmet. It's it. So technically, you could say Abraham was in hell. And I was going to freak out. Like, you're saying he's burning it? No. What I'm saying is as a great gulf between the fiery place and the, the, what we would, you know, we could say the paradise, the part that's where Abraham and the Old Testament saints are, is a huge gulf. That's it. Now, what we were taught as dispensationists is after the resurrection, God took everyone and now it's all empty. I don't believe that. I th I, I'm, they're still waiting. Um, what do you mean by hell is a helmet? Like an umbrella? Uh, the word itself is related to helmet. It's a covering. So I, I'm okay. big on etymology and studying the root, roots of words, specifically also in English, because I believe God doesn't speak just Greek and Hebrew. I think he speaks English, Chinese, and a bunch of other languages. So with that said, um, helmet hell i'm just trying to get everyone to understand that it's a simply a covering so if jesus went to hell i'm not thinking that he went to, into the flames and he, and he and he and he delivered himself to the flames i'm not saying that at all which is what acts tells us it's acts if you're a king james believer it's clear you got to admit it went he went to hell so for us the KJ, kjv quote unquote only is well, that's we have to believe it he went to hell um when was galatians written Ooh, that's pretty early. I think around 54 AD. Um, first Thessalonians, though, was was my understanding was the first epistle that was written right after Acts chapter 15. Not not too long after that. That's interesting. You 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 your date on Galatians is later than mine. Um, uh, but is it but is it before Acts 15? No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. I, I shouldn't answer your question. So. My bad. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, we got two minutes, Charles. Do you hold a northern view or a southern view of the book of Galatians? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, the it actually, basically what it deals with is what was the situation that was being addressed. Mm, you know, okay. That affects that. Now, I don't exhaustively have that on my mind, but I just wondered if maybe uh, that may have affected how you understand when you're dating for Galatians. You know, I'm just trying to get an idea about the time between James and Galatians. Is 30 seconds. Got it. Got it. Okay. Last question. Matthew 21. 
what is the mm -hmm. significance of mentioned in Matthew 21? Uh, yeah, so that's can be one minute on this, Donnie, please. And this will be this. Is, I'll shut up half of this. OK, so here's the thing. In James, I believe the epistle, the object is the poor and the rich. You have to understand. You have to go back historically and put yourself in James's shoes and everyone else's shoes. There was a huge divide. There was essentially no middle class. And we know from the rich young ruler what God thinks of rich people. And so what I want everyone to understand is that you have the poor, the, the rich in faith. You have the rich, weak in faith. Essentially, we would say non-believers, people like this don't have what it takes to, to get to gain eternal life. And so this concept of figs and vines and, uh, and, and olives is also emphasized in Romans because, like I said in one of my slides, I believe Roman. I believe Romans. Paul's taking James because it's a huge epistle. It was it was well it was well loved and was well it was it was all over the empire. And he's saying, look, I'm going to take elements within this epistle and I'm going to expound upon them more and open up more. And so that's why when he's writing nine through eleven in Romans, you have these people with like James in their head saying, well, wait a minute, we're we're the wild olive branch, you know, or if we're the poor, we're the ones who are like the adulterers, the the, the lesser. The lower people, but the rich, the people who had it, the people who had everything, the rulers of the of the Israel of Israel Israel nation, those are the people that Jesus looks at and says, guys, you lost it. I'm giving it to the least of my brethren. That's who the ones I'm going to get it. So definitely, I wrote math. So to in conclusion, Matthew 21 explains Romans chapter 11. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for the 10 minute cross exam. For anybody in the audience just joining us, we have now uh, done the first 20 minute opening statement, which was from David. Then we had a 10 minute cross exam where Charles led the way. Now we're gonna have a 20 minute opening statement from Charles. Then we're gonna have a cross exam from, from David. So this is going to be a very, very comprehensive debate. And Charles, we are going to hand it over to you. I can see your screen shared. Can and you whenever you're me? ready, you've got 20 minutes. Can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Yep. All right, all right. All right, go. So the title for this debate is What is the Best Exegesis of James Chapter 2? I talked about this in my last debate. There's a distinction between exegesis and biblical theology and systematic theology. But to be fair, uh, I noticed that in the emails that uh, David asked, uh, you know, thought about the idea, well, wouldn't it be a better title to call it Does James Teach Faith and Works for Salvation? But I understand why SFT wanted to, to uh, use the term exegesis because these debates that we're involved in are on particular passages and they're very technical in nature. So here's a helpful chart. This is from Zuck that shows us in the process. We look at the text, our, our principles of interpretation. Here's exegesis right here. But theological correlation, whether that's bi biblical or systematic, is wherever you're pulling from other stuff outside of James is involved. Another chart, this is actually from one of MacArthur's books, shows that, you know, the relationship of languages and hermeneutics to biblical exegesis and then biblical theologies here. Now, um, the way I'm understanding this is that we have Leviticus 18.5 here. OK, this is a key passage. Uh, that David emphasizes and that I'm going to concede is a very important point. And so the idea is, is that Leviticus 18.5 is like a pebble and it, and it has ripples throughout the, re the rest of the Bible. Charles, so my yeah. good man. Yes, sir. I'm going to pause your timer. No worries. I was wondering, and it's completely up to you. Uh, the chat was recommending you put it on full screen, but if you're more comfortable this way. Oh, no, 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 that's, no, that's good. That's good. I forgot that I was, sorry, guys. I'm oh, no worries. Right no now. worries. I apologize for that. Okay, so and, and maybe click hide on the. Uh, yeah. Right, okay, right. you're good, cool. Charles. Thanks. Go ahead. All right. So, at Leviticus eighteen five, I think it is the pebble that drops, and it causes a ripple effect throughout, where it refers to the Old Testament right here. Now, the, the, where this X is is what some people call the silent years, when I believe that God was not given inspired revelation, and so the the. The, uh, the Apocrypha, the um, Pseudepigrapha, all that type of stuff was at that time. And then you have the pre-cross time, okay? Then you have the Acts 2 time, and then you have the James 2 time, and then you have the rest of the New Testament. 
I agree with David that we're not really venturing into this right here. Okay. Now the difference is, is that uh, as the last debate shows, um, uh, David believes there's a lot of support that comes from this intertestamental literature for his understanding of uh, Leviticus 18.5. Okay. The reason I bring that up is because in this debate, James uh, I asked a question about the tribulation because that's going to be in the, in a future time after this. All right. And, and he said that it, it, he did, one did not have to believe that James is occurring during the tribulation to hold to his view. The other thing is, is that the passage uh, deals with the pre-cross time uh, concerning the sermon on the Mount. And so I think that if 18 five is interpreted the way David takes it, then you don't need the silent years of literature to understand that, and the ripple would still go through. But if but if but if it's understood in my view, then then uh, the same ripple will go about. It just would have my my interpretation of that. So just keep that in mind. That the crux passage is Leviticus eighteen five, and eighteen five is symbolic because there's probably revelation about the same concept prior to that. I think. But that's the passage David chose, so I'll move forward. Okay, so these debates have challenged me. So I'm going to concede wherever I can, and I'm going to do my best to follow the logic of David, and because a lot of this I'm uh, not familiar with. Now, in the midst of that, I may see, okay, now I know the implications of what he's saying, so I'll pull back. But don't think that because I do that, that I'm flip-flopping. If I can't change my words or change my mind, then why are we debating? And, and why are you listening in the point? Both David and I at least in, 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 uh, testify to this idea of radical openness, that we want to move the ball further uh, uh, rather than to just win a debate. So that's important for us to recognize. All right. So David Pre Preston says he's a dispensationalist. I won't deny that. He says he's free grace. I won't deny that. He says that Schofield uh, uh, and Chafer believed that there was more than one way of salvation, uh, that salvation was by faith plus works in the Old Testament. Uh, I agree that more work needs to be done in that area. Okay, I'm showing you the progress that we've made between the previous debate and this debate. He encouraged us to not dismiss apocalyptic and pseudographic literature, and that challenged me to study it more in detail. Uh, he believed that these things support his position. I believed at that time is during the silent years. He kind of believes that the Second Temple uh, beliefs at that time concerning salvation were monolithic. That's an area where I'm still studying. And of course, I don't believe that those texts during the silent years are inspired. Now, I can't call um, David a mid-Acts dispensationalist because he said in other statements that he's not sure when the church began. So it's possible, I think, that the church could have been, began in Acts 2 and just was primarily Jewish. Um, I'm an Acts 2 dispensationalist. I believe the church began uh, at that time. We could say that what he believes in is Pauline salvation. Uh, I believe in the concept of biblical salvation, the idea that salvation is the same throughout the whole Bible. Um, so that's what we see after that. He would say salvation is not the same. I say it's the same. I'm showing you that there's a real debate going on. There's a difference in how we view things. He would say that sanctification is not the same. I would say the sanctification is the same throughout the Bible. All right. So going on, he would say that this is for the tribulation. I would say it's for the church age. He would say it's faith plus works. I would say it's by grace through faith alone. He focuses on salvation. I focus on sanctification. More specific, even though I don't think this term is clear enough, he would focus on positional salvation. I focus on experiential sanctification. He focuses on eternal life quantity. I focus on quality of life passages. He would see the concept of enduring to the end to refer to being saved from the hell. And uh, I would say uh, the emphasize the three, that there's three aspects of eternal life position, experience, and ultimate. Okay, so we both agree that Leviticus is key. We disagree about faith plus works. We agree about the three tenses or aspects of salvation 
are taught. The difference is, is that David limits it to the to Paul's revelation, where I believe it's taught throughout scripture. So the issue is, is that we got to talk about what is positional salvation. Well, I want to clarify this because this is what came up in the last debate. Because uh, um, David asked me a question. He said, well, if, if that's not positional salvation, I don't know what it is. So let me clarify what positional salvation is. It happens in one moment or an event. So if it includes a process or activities after that one moment or event, it cannot be positional. Now, to describe this a little bit, y'all might have seen this chart from the, from the last debate. You could call it A truth, B truth, and C truth, position, experience, and ultimate. For those that are not aware, positional justification, experiential sanctification, ultimate glorification. There's the one moment in time right there. Here's the process. And then you get a glorified body at a certain point in time. And then, therefore, you're able to perfectly represent God. Now, the way that David thinks is James leads to Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus leads to the Old Testament. Leviticus is key. I have no problem with any of that statement right there. The issue is, is concerning the intertestamental literature. But I'm probably, I, I think that, that um, David would say that you don't have to hold his view of the intertestamental literature as key for understanding the passage. It just supplements it or, or clarifies it perhaps. All right. So Leviticus 18.5. I would say that, that uh, the passage would talk about positional faith, which is one time event. But uh, whenever we're talking about experiential faith, we're talking about plus works. And so that's the thing to understand is that a passage can have both a positional and an experiential. I would probably put all of it as experiential. Now in James 2, positional faith is the one moment when you uh, when you believe uh, for salvation. Okay, Experiential faith is what you believe uh, whenever you're applying scripture, what God wants you to do. And so that's the relationship of what some call works. And perfect faith, you can say when you got a glorified body, you're able to perfectly represent. Now, Matthew 5.20, a very important passage because uh, when we're going to the Sermon on the Mount, where, where it says, unless your righteous exceed the righteous of Pharisees, David would probably take that as, uh, well, I'm not going to say David. I'm going to say most people take this as positional righteousness, that the righteousness that Christ uh, gave to you. I take it as experiential righteousness. I believe that this sermon is about G Jesus' teaching uh, concerning the time of offering the kingdom and discipleship material in the meantime. Okay. So David's view is that uh, James of Zebedee is the author. I think it's James' half-brother, but that's not an issue. I don't think that that makes or breaks the case. He believes that, that, the, uh, that, what we're, that James is written prior to Paul's revelation, and I agree with that. I agree that, that James is not aware of the things that Paul is going to reveal. I agree that it's to the 12 tribes of Israel. The difference is, though, is I believe that the Israelites are all Christians, where um, David uh, may not believe that. We'll have to find out. David believes that it concerns the gospel of the kingdom, okay? I believe that the kingdom was not being offered now, and I'm open to the idea that there was an offering later on, but even if it is offered, I don't think this is a, a, the kingdom is soteriological. It's eschatological here. Um, I agree that Jesus's earthly teaching is important. And, and David brings up alms, cover for sin, remembering the poor, keeping the law of Moses. And all of those concepts that Jesus mentions that are related to James, I would just say they're related to experiential sanctification. Okay, now here's Constable's notes if we need to go into it, some options about the different who the author is. I really don't think that that's important for this debate. So I don't mind if James comes to be about the tribulation. The issue is, is that then the argument would be, does the tribulation teach that salvation is by faith or as works? I would, of course, say that that was by grace, by faith only, even in the tribulation. So David is basically saying that, that James is talking of just as Jesus was like under the law. And I would agree, but the difference is, is that he's talking about salvation. I'm talking about sanctification. And so, of course, I would say salvation is by grace through faith only. I already mentioned about the kingdom offer, uh, the issue about, you know, whether the kingdom is accepted or rejection. 
So the issue is, is that could the Sermon on the Mount, as well as the book of James, be related to application while they were waiting for the kingdom? So David would see positional righteousness in order to be positionally saved. I see his experiential righteousness. I know some of this repeats, but I, I think I need to do this. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Revelation passages. I have not studied that Revelation passage. I'm not focused on eschatology right now. So there may be an area where David gets me for right now, but we'll just see. So everything flows from the Leviticus passage. Okay, David Preston's arguing that salvation is from hell. I'm arguing that it's experiential or temporal. He's arguing for faith to be safe from hell. I'm talking about experiential faith. He's arguing for positional justification. I'm arguing for experiential justification. He's arguing, I think, that dead faith means you're not saved. I'm arguing that it means that you're not useful or productive. He would say that works are for positional salvation. I believe that it's just saying that it's for being useful to God and to others. So going into the text, until my time runs out, passages like James 1-2, where it talks about brethren, I take that as referring to Jewish Christians that are all saved. Uh, David may have a different view. So you see the word brother re recur throughout this. The statement about crown of life I mentioned, I believe it's associated with rewards. Uh, David uh, is taking it, I think, is in the sense of, of positional for here. Once again, my beloved brethren, not just brethren. Um, in James 1.18, in this exercise will, he brought us forth. I believe this is a statement about positional regeneration. Uh, and then the rest of it is focusing on application. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, sort of like the life lessons that David mentioned uh, from James' own life. Um, so I take it the anger of man does not achieve the righteous to God, that this is experiential righteous, in other words, practical. Um, 21, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all remain weakness and humility, receive the word. I believe this is talking about experientially. And then it's when which is able to save your souls. That souls is not talking about how to be saved from hell. This is concerning experiential sanctification. Moving forward, we have the law of liberty, which I take to refer to sanctification because it's talking about being blessed in what one does. When you apply your faith in your walk, it pleases the Lord and you're blessed for it. Uh, the religious concept that's involved in here is the application of things. And notice it's talking about the idea of worthless religion as opposed to useful religion. So 27, pure and undefiled religion is this, given to orphans and widows and keeping oneself unstained by the world, which I take as refers to experiential sanctification. Now, James 2, 1, my brother, do not hold your faith in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, when it says do not hold, I take this as experiential holding this okay and it's like you hold yourself you carry yourself in such a way and then the faith here is experiential faith okay and so he's basically arguing against the favoritism right here when it's talking about inheritance it's possible this is positional inheritance or experiential inheritance we can explore that the royal law i would take that this does refer to the Mosaic law, probably, and that uh, it's whatever the law has been given up to that time. James has on, only has the Old Testament to work with, as well as the revelation that was given in Acts 2 and things like that. They don't know what Paul knows, and so they're trying to figure things out. Now, that means that what they have is sufficient for their time. I'm not saying it's wrong or whatever. It's just not complete, and I think that um, David may even agree with that to an extent. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin or convicted by a law of transgressions. For whoever keeps the whole law stumbles at one point, he's become guilty of it all. I don't think this is a salvation passage. This concerns sanctification. The point is, if you're a hypocrite in one area, you're considered a hypocrite concerning the area of sanctification. All right. So you could talk about the, the divisions here. This is from Dillo. Salvation of the soul from death in 121. Uh, Salvation from loss of the Jesuit seat of Christ in 2.14, which is the primary passage we're going to be dealing with. Salvation from sin's penalties, not talking about from hell in James 4.12. Salvation from disease in James 5.15. And salvation from physical death in 5.19 through 20. So in here, this is where we start seeing why we need salvation in this passage, experiential salvation. 
And two, it says, so speak and so act to those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. So this is a temporal judgment, which means that they need to be temporally delivered. And so you could call this a temporal salvation. So they could be underneath the divine discipline from the Lord for this. James 2.14, what use is it, my brethren? So this is talking about experiential use. In other words, how to be useful to God and how to be useful to others. Can that faith save them? Now, this could be temp from temporal salvation, from temporal judgment of the divine discipline or the hymn. And this is just at an observation level could refer to being a usefulness to the person that's struggling, poverty, that's hungry and all of that, because 15 talks about that. Now, uh, the issue about death, I'm taking it as to be not useful or productive. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself, experiential faith once again. The issue in James 2, 17, uh, in 18 and 20, you have what's called a diatribe, wherever it's introduced, but while someone may say, and, the, and it closes with, you foolish fellow. So it's like James uh, quoting his imagined opponent. A lot of people get this wrong. They put the quotations in the wrong place and they misuse verse 19. Okay, so in James 2, 19, once again, you have this idea of uselessness and this issue about justification. Was not Abraham our father justified? I take that as referring to experiential justification. By works when he offered up Isaac, his son, at the altar. You see that faith was working. That's experiential faith. Was working would be experiential works with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected or matured or perhaps even exemplified. Okay, so what I'm talking about right here is the passage talking about Abraham believed God and his record to him is righteous. This is experiential belief for experiential righteousness and, and talking about how he's called experientially the friend of God. So going on further, when it's talking about faith right here, experiential faith is applied faith. In other words, whenever you are pleasing God by doing His the works that he requires you to do while in fellowship with him. All right, so we could go into talking about how Dillo makes this claim about uh, that the word salvation is associated with 40% of the time in the New Testament is, con is not talking about hell. And he says it's not even once in the Old Testament. Now, David would differ with that, of course, because of, 20 how, seconds. Because of how he views salvation in the Old Testament. Um, but anyway, um, I'm done. Anyway, God bless. Awesome. Thank you, Charles, for that 20 minute opening statement. Um, we've now gotten the uh, both 20 minute opening statements uh, out of the way so far. Great job, gentlemen. Appreciate all the prep, all the hard work, the visuals, the slides. Great job. So, OK, we're moving into the next 10 minute cross exam. This time we've got David leading the way, and he'll be leading the way for 10 minutes. So, David and Charles, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Charles. Good job, by the way. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, let's see here. Just for clarification, do you think that I was saying that James was teaching that they're in the tribulation then at that time? No. Uh, okay. you, you believe it has a, a good application for that. It was essentially on the horizon, mm -hmm. not happening. So I just want okay, I just want to make that clear that, that you that you and I are on the same page on that. That James isn't saying this is the tribulation right now. This is just Jacob's troubles. It's okay. on the horizon. Okay, cool. All right. So let's let's. What one thing is is I know that you and I are in a minority kind of. I'm I'm. It's you know in this. So I want to try to please the SFT listeners too and try to address some of their thoughts already and try to get into their shoes. Versus just staying in the exper experiential world and the, uh, the, the the dispensational world. So, with that said, in the you you can you possibly you think it's possible that James and Zebedee could have at least written the epistle, correct? Sure, I don't. I have no problem with that. I may okay. pull back later, but I don't see any problem with that. Cool. Now, is it possible that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the Book of Romans, that he was responding to things specifically in the book of James? Uh, I don't think that he was countering James. I think he was just clarifying James. 
you think he was clarifying James? How, how so? Well, most people will say that James teaches uh, justification before man, and Paul teaches justification before God. Yeah, and I, don't I agree think with that. they're. I think they're both teaching experiential justification. All right. So that leads me to my next question. My understanding is is that you get a lot of your ideas with uh, this positional. I like to say standing versus state. Personally, that's mm. what I, I like to use. But I'll just stick with your terminology, which is it's, it's, it's dispensational. But this idea of positional, experiential, uh, where do you get most of that in the scriptures? Like, like if you're like, is it Paul that teaches that primarily this idea of sanctification that, that you know of? Well, I would definitely say Paul clarifies those issues more, more, more so than anybody else. Okay, but that's my assumption. I haven't looked closely at it, but yeah, is it is it safe I mean, to I say see it, I see it everywhere? Got it. I know you do. Yeah, I mean it respectfully. <laughs> so, with understanding that, is it possible to say? Let's just say I took away all that your Pauline epistles, I deleted your brain. You didn't even know who Paul Paul was, and all I put in front of you was. James, you're you're somewhere in Spain at a synagogue, and all you have is the letter of James. Can you come to that conclusion about positional versus experiential? Because I, I, the reason I ask that question is, I, like I said, I want to put myself. This is all I have. I have the letter of James. Okay, and and uh, it's in my language. Maybe maybe it's in Syriac. Maybe he wrote it in Syriac too, not just Greek. And he's giving it to me, and I don't have anything else except I have the Torah. I have the prophets. Where do I get that? And that, that's one reason why I mentioned, you know, James and Ebony in the early date. Where do I get this teaching that you're teaching within the epistle of James? Do I even get it? Uh, no, you don't get it from James. You get it from the Old Testament. You get it from the, the teachings of Jesus. The only thing is, is that when we're reading the teachings of Jesus, as you know, they're written later on during the church age. So we're not getting it exactly everything. All right. So if I just have the letter of James, it's possible for me to come to the conclusion that, you know what, this is actually talking about my sanctification, whether I'm going to, how, what kind of, how am I going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ? Is that your opinion? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you think only, you, you think you can get that just by reading the book of James. If I'm again, going back 45 AD, whatever, it's all I have in front of my face. You think I can come to that conclusion? Well, I, I think you can get to the three column chart uh, from from uh, antecedent revelation before James. Right. Now, but the judgment seat of Christ, I know that specific language that Paul used. So right. I, I don't want to use that terminology. Um, okay. Maybe there's other categories we can describe that as. Go ahead. All right. So it is safe to say, though, that it, it, it benefits us to have Pauline epistles, correct? Especially oh, you. All right. Absolutely. Now, in regards to sanctification, you you know that I don't believe that we were uh, the, that the uh, people in the Old Testament were regen regenerated by the Holy Ghost. Uh, I believe that's a um, that's a, a post Calvary um, uh, event. Uh, so, with that said, how do you reconcile that you that with your idea of sanctification in the Old Testament? Well. The, the issue about regeneration is that it, it probably occurred, but I can't prove it occurred. All right. The, mm. it, just because the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit wasn't occurring because the church didn't exist, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit ministry wasn't occurring in the same way. Uh, just because the Holy Spirit was operating differently doesn't mean people were not saved. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Do you agree, though, that that the body of Christ wasn't in existence in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Abraham, let's say he wasn't put in the body of Christ where there's no Jew or Greek, right? He, that, right. that concept was foreign to him. He, you know, he might know about it now. I don't know. Uh, all right. So also, let's see here. Uh, let's we got a few minutes left. Great, great. Um, why? Why is James temporal? Where do you get that just in James that is just focused on the temporal? Again, you don't got Paul, man. Where yeah. this is 45 AD. I I think that from the Pentateuch alone, if you just read the Pentateuch alone, you would come to the conclusion that we read all these passages wrong 
concerning about how to get saved. That, that that's not the intent of scripture, and that's not the focus of what the people were were involved in. It, it, it was about sanctification. Okay. All right. Can you give me at least one example, real quick? One example of what? Of that, what you just said. You said in the Old Testament you can teach. Can you give me one example of of, of that specifically, of, of positional and an experiential? Yeah, when he says, I set before you life and death, choose life. And in context, choosing life refers to the covenant blessings. Okay. And so, again, we debated that, got that. So then I understand that's what it hinged on. So essentially, if if David Preston can prove that Leviticus 18.5 is positional, and I don't really like to use that because I don't believe positional was used in the Old Testament, but I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, kind of go along with your language that we would say that then definitely I would be in the right, correct? If Leviticus 18.5 was quote unquote positional. Well, did you understand my clarification about positional? It has to happen in one moment. Yes. Yeah. It's not a continual thing. Yeah. And the reason I said quote unquote positional is because I don't believe, and this is good for clarification from the last debate. I don't believe that, that, that uh, Abraham was positionally saved. And what I'm saying is that this idea of positional experiential doesn't actually take place until after the cross because nobody is placed in Christ until after the cross. Nobody is regenerated by the Holy Ghost. Okay. Now, okay, thank you. Uh, what what did – and we only got two minutes left, so I'm, I might interrupt you a few times, so just forgive me. What was – what what did James teach for salvation? Or did he even teach – he didn't even teach salvation at all in James. Is that, is that your belief? The closest passage is probably where it says he brought us forth. Okay. And so do you think that um, when it says the doer of the law or the, so the doer of the word, is that is he talking about the Mosaic law? Is he pairing it up with um, – or is Paul pairing up with what he said, which is the law? He's just saying to obey the word of God. Right. Whatever is well, revealed at that time, obey it. In his context, so all he has is the Moses and the prophets. So to him, essentially, what we would say is the law of Moses. Would well, you he, agree? Has, he has the law of Christ, if you're taking the Sermon on the Mount language and, and whatever Christ has revealed at that right. time. He also has apostolic right. teaching as well. Yeah. Well, is, isn't it safe to say, though, that the law of Christ in which he taught on earth is nothing more than love thy neighbor, which is perfectly aligned with the law of Moses, give to the poor, you know, um, give alms. Uh, I mean, do you not see an agreement there? There's there's carryovers. There's principles of comparison and things like that where it's talking about sanctification and all of that. The issue right. is, is that I don't hold the eternal law like the kingdom on context argument that it means. I try. Yeah, to I don't trace, either. I try to trace the progressive revelation. What content was known? Charles, Go ahead, sir. Got it. I got one question. And obviously this, this, is, this is the last one. I think a lot of this hinges between our debate, uh, whether or not he was speaking to unbelievers and believers or, you know, or, or, you know, you think it's simply Christians, even though specifically says the 12 tribes. OK, so with that said, just the last my last question is this. Uh, James chapter five, it says, go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasures together for the last days. Now, I'll, I'll behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Here's where I'm going to finish. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So you think in chapter five, you think that James right there is addressing Christians? It's possible. Uh, even within people in my camp, they differ about is he addressing unbelievers? Because this could be imprecatory. Um, because during a time of persecution, then you have unbelieving Jews that are causing problems. So I'm not denying that. But I I have no problem with the idea that they're believers. All right, gentlemen, that's 10 minutes. And uh, great job. Very uh, technical, sophisticated so far. So 
Um, we got some questions flying in from the audience. Love it. Just make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth. We've now uh, we've now completed the opening statements and the uh, cross exams, and we're moving into a 10 minute rebuttal, and then we're going to have a more free flowing discussion. So uh, let's hand it over to David since you started off uh, with your opening statement and the last opening statement was from Charles, we'll give you the floor for 10 minutes, a 10 minute rebuttal whenever you're ready. Go ahead. All right, time to start. You have a dispens you have two dispensationalists, you have an experientialist to the extreme and you have one that I think is more balanced. And so I know a lot of you out there that are watching uh, may be confused or like you're not addressing what I think is uh, what is the uh, the argument. So I'm going to ask you to please ask these questions. I don't want to I don't want to uh, forget you or avoid you in any way. Uh, but still, I think it's possible for both Charles and I to deliver uh, um, uh, the proper view of James. I think more of me. We do agree in some areas, but I think it's still possible being that we're dispensationalists, obviously, um, I think that's the right hermeneutic, but being that we're both dispensationalists, I think that anyone can walk away and say, hmm, that makes sense. I don't agree with you, but I could see how you come to that view. And that's really one of my goals. In fact, I sent my slides to Charles. Uh, I would have sent him a day earlier. I didn't have them done. But I sent them to him because, as he stated, our goal is essentially is to sharpen each other. Uh, this is not a I got you moment. This is not I'm, I make you look stupid or, yeah, Charles totally won or Charles totally lost. I mean, we know he's going to lose. No, I'm just kidding, Charles. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is simply the objective is to sharpen each other and to, and to utilize what um, utilize this platform that Donnie has given us. So please keep that in mind. When you um, are, when you watch this debate, now understand this. I believe that James was writing to the poor and rich of the nation of Israel, to all the twelve, to all within the twelve tribes of Israel. We could say saved, unrighteous, or unrighteous, just, and the unjust; those who were headed towards eternal life and those who were headed towards damnation. I think it's evident, especially in James chapter five, that that is clearly expressed. Uh, I look forward to having a maybe more in-depth discussion on that uh, when we get to our 30 minutes. Also, one thing I want the listeners to be aware of is that in James chapter one, uh, and I know Charles didn't really get to get to get to get get to this, but in James chapter one, I think we need to understand that. It is it, James chapter two is simply re reteaching what is already taught in James chapter two. And growing up, I never had that connection. And uh, I think it's important that when we hear hearing is to have faith and doing is to work, we have to understand in light, especially of what Paul said years later, that much of what James is teaching has to do simply with faith and works positionally, as Charles would use. But I don't think that term would have been expressed during the time of James because Paul hasn't even shown up yet. But essentially, I think James is perfectly in line with the Ju with Judaism. And I know it's a bad word to some of you because you think all the Jews, especially back then, were corrupt and can't be trusted. Shame on you. That's not true. Uh, but anyways, so what I what I want you to understand is that in James chapter one, the emphasis is simply doers and hearers and the rich and the poor. And if you take that concept and you take it all the way back to Jesus's earthly ministry, you're going to see it perfectly aligned. If you take it with Peter and, and John and even Jude, you're going to see a perfect unity. And you don't see that within the Pauline epistles. And that's why I emphasize the fact that the Pauline revelation of the body of Christ, of the, uh, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost, uh, of Christ in you, the hope of glory, that wasn't even known by James and John and Peter until Paul arrived on the scene. I'll give you $2 billion if you could prove me wrong on that. Uh, and now, so also we have to understand that this concept of sanctification that Charles believes occurred in the Old Testament 
is not present. There is no sanctification like we see, quote unquote, in the New Testament happening in the Old Testament. Uh, as I said, the Holy Spirit didn't even regenerate you. That is one of like the key pillars of the doctrine of sanctification, regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Yet he admitted it, that it didn't occur in the Old Testament. Yet he tries to tell us that positional and experiential are, are clearly taught in the, in the Old Testament. I think, Charles, you're wanting an evidence there. And definitely, if it was true, we would have a big issue for sure. Uh, let me uh, state this clearly, that when we are talking about faith and works, again, as I mentioned in the beginning uh, of this program, uh, I firmly believe that is it is by faith and only by faith today. Um, I look at the book of James as a book that was written during a early transitional period. I believe that God was still offering the gospel of the kingdom. He was still offering it to the nation of Israel, giving them plenty of mercy and grace, extending it well beyond uh, well beyond where he needed to extend it to. And James simply, simply is expressing these truths within his writings and sending them all over the Roman Empire to teach these synagogues, hey, listen, you need to be not only hearers of the word, not only have faith, in the word of God, in the law of Moses, but you also need to be doers. You need to work at it. And so when we, he brings up the example of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, it's in, it's, it is very important to understand that in, James, in Genesis chapter 22, which is a beautiful type of Christ chapter, uh, it turns out that the word loveth or even love in any form is first used in that chapter. Of our King James Bible, and I think that's significant and not by chance. But understand this in Genesis chapter 22, 22 representing even Jesus Christ, I believe. I think what's happening is that Abraham is faith, as just as James said, is made perfect. And we see this when James brings up the two occurrences of James, James 15 and James 22. All James is simply trying to express to his brethren. And by the way, you don't have to necessarily be a believer for us to say brethren. Obviously, we know that Paul called the unsaved, uh, or we would say the, un the unjust, the unbelievers, brethren also to the nation of Israel. So understand that when James is talking about this concept of, hey, we got the rich, the unjust. We got the poor, the just, rich in faith. Listen to me. Don't act like the rich and poor and rich. You need to act like the poor. You need to give alms. You need to take care of the, the, the need as we see at the end of James chapter one. Uh, you need to be unspotted. These are concepts that Charles would not teach seriously to a new convert or let's say to a, a, a person that uh, is on the street that doesn't believe in Jesus. You know why? Because Charles doesn't believe that the book of James and for the most part, the whole Bible is even for the unbelievers. That's very uh, important to understand because it is for everybody. It's not just for unbeliever, uh, believers and unbelievers. Now, I will say this, that uh, we have to understand who the letter is written to. Yes, but I believe that all scripture is profitable and that we can use portions of Leviticus to teach us things. But to, to apply it to us every single time doctrinally, no. Obviously, we know murder is not good. That's not good. But if my son disobeys me and dishonors his parents, I'm not going to stone him. Not even close. Now, James, on the other hand, is still living in a period where the Pauline revelation is not known. And the gospel of the kingdom is still being delivered to the nation of Israel. And if we understand this, if we understand this concept of, wait a minute, James is not aware of the concepts of Paul. Prove to me. He is aware, and I'll give you $2 billion. James has a huge issue with the rich, much like his Savior, Jesus Christ. Many times they're viewed as unjust and, and not worthy of eternal life. We have to understand that James is telling us that he is speaking to, to the unjust and the, and the just within the synagogues all around the world. Now, I have, a few, I have about 30 seconds left, and, and, and I want to say this. 
I think ultimately James lost his head because of the letter he wrote. I think he attacked the establishment. He attacked the ruling elite. And when he came back to Jerusalem from his missionary journeys, he ended up getting his head, getting it be, I think he was beheaded. He was killed because he was a significant leader in the, in the early, uh, uh, in the early movement of, of I won't, I don't want, you could say Christianity. The word Christian was actually used a chapter prior. It was the first time in Antioch. But let's just say, fine, Christians. He was one of the, the first to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to write it in a letter. And he attacked specifically those who were at the top of the pyramid. And that eventually, I believe, caused his death. This topic is very important. It's important to understand the historical context. And if we do not understand the historical context, we are going to have confusion, division, and doubt. Thank you. All right, David, that was your 10-minute rebuttal. Much appreciated. We're going to now, uh, now hand it to Charles, Charles Jennings. You also have a 10-minute rebuttal, and then we're going to head into a free-flowing discussion. So, Charles, whenever you're ready, let, uh, let me know, and we'll go ahead. Okay, um, so I'm ready. You know, I'm glad... I'm glad that David in the very beginning clarified his view concerning the tribulation because I listened to a guy named Hensley and he was making passages apply more directly to the tribulation. And uh, so I'm glad for that, you know, and honestly, it's very hard right now at this moment. I'm going to need David Preston to push up against me to bring stuff out of me right now because I'm not very, uh, engaged in this right now. Um, now, the whole issue about doers or hearers and the reteaching stuff, my mind automatically goes to the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, which, of course, I take is experiential. Um, let's see here. The My basis for sanctification is this. Number one, you could call it a logical thing. One of the basis is that if you identify a process in Scripture, then that implies that a process has a beginning. Sometimes that uh, beginning of that process is explicit. Other times it's not. When it's not, it's still implied because every process has a beginning. Another thing concerning the concept of sanctification, it's a basis of understanding covenants. They are not sociological categories or sanctification categories. They're master-servant relationships, Susan vassal treaties. I talked about that in the last debate and things like that. Um, so there's that aspect of things as for things I wouldn't teach to Christians today. I want you to challenge me on that. Uh, David, show me some things that you think that I could not say today, uh, to a Christian in discipleship. Now, of course, in evangelism, you know, uh, I, I would never use an experiential, uh, sanctification passage, uh, as to interpretation for evangelism. Now, this is what I also want to say. The Bible, I believe, uh, this assertion is that it's written to believers for believers. Now, God has given gifted men, and one of those gifts or offices is evangelism. I believe that if you are truly skilled in how to interpret and apply scripture, then you can take almost any passage of scripture and draw a primary and secondary application, which means that you can draw application for an unbeliever. But there's a distinction between interpretation and application. David is arguing that the interpretation for James is a justification uh, by faith plus works. I'm arguing that it's by grace through faith alone. Regardless of who the author is, I, I don't see how that makes a distinction in things. And, it, and, it's inter and, and I know why David's passionate about this and about the context and everything, but I... I need, I need a challenge. You know, I, I got to look, I got to look and see if there's anything. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Maybe this will get me more energized into this. Um, this is actually a screenshot from our first uh, live uh, James two discussion that I did on SMT's channel. And so you have the word uh, so right here, that word uh, for salvation used throughout uh, scripture. And I pointed it out in James and what's interesting is, is that in the Septuagint, the first time the Greek word, at least in the sweet Septuagint, is used for salvation, it's temporal. 
when they had brought them outside, one said, escape for your life. Now notice life here is talking about physical life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Now the context, of course, is Sodom and Gomorrah, if I remember right. But the point is, is that if you're going to make an argument about salvation, the word salvation and stuff, I think this is a good place to start looking, you know. How was the word first used in the Bible? How was the word life being used here? Suke, because when you're reading James and it's using the word soul or you're reading stuff that Jesus mentioned in the Gospels and it's using that, I think it's wrong to read the psychology concept in there. David mentioned that he likes the temperaments. You know, my undergraduates in sociology and psychology. So, you know, we know the word suke is where the word psychology comes from. You know, I don't agree with the temperament views, you know, uh, concerning that, but I'm aware of it. I just think that we need to bring it when we see the word suke, we need to consider that it does relate to physical life as well as psychological well-being. There are times in scripture wherever it's emphasizing the mental state, the emotional state, you could even say, and then the physical temporal deliverance, um, you know. I, I think I have argued that in James chapter 2, that there is a concept of temporal judgment. They're in danger of being disciplined by the Lord because of their hypocriticalness. And I don't think that just because you have rich and poor and prideful and self-righteous people, and that even if it does happen in the synagogue with, where Jewish Christians met, I don't think that changes. The reality is that there are Christians today that have the same attitudes and that they can be underneath the temporal discipline of the Lord for that. I think that if if David continues his study of Dillo's book, not because I think Dillo is the greatest there is, but I think it's most helpful in this area, is that he'll start seeing that the stuff of James and the stuff of the Old Testament is actually in Paul. Right now, um, David has Paul isolated from everything else. And I think the... Um, the movement, would you want to call it appalling dispensationalism or whatever, it was a good attempt because it, it was an attempt at biblical theology. In biblical theology, what you do is you look at a period of time, you look at a genre, you look at what was revealed up to that time, and you look at what this author particularly uh, contributed. And I'm fascinated by the challenge and the idea of thinking about, okay, if all we had is James, in fact, when I wrote my paper on Romans and, and on my other one on Galatians, I started with James. I, I And then I went to Galatians because that's how I see it. James first, then the book of Galatians. Uh, I think sanctification is there. Um, maybe uh, uh, through the challenge of this debate's mentioned, but I hope that some of you in the audience will uh, challenge me, get me stirred up, you know, uh, because right now it's like, it's like Eminem said, you know, he says, I'm, he says something like, I'm all out of rap. I'm all, all out of Backstreet Boys to attack. The point is he was bored. He wasn't challenged. And so what I need is the fuel for the fire to burn so that I could return and reply back. So David, bring it. God bless. Okay, thank you, um, Charles. That concludes uh, the rebuttals. And uh, overall, that concludes the opening statements the cross exam and also the rebuttal. So now we're moving into a free flowing discussion where we are really going to uh, debate and discuss the details. And again, uh, the question for tonight, what is the best exegesis or understanding of James two? David holds to a faith plus works position in terms of James two, that is while uh, Charles uh, holds the uh, faith alone position of James two and that it is teaching uh, temporal uh, salvation or physical salvation. So again, I want to stick as much to the topic as possible, uh, gentlemen, in terms of uh, James 2. Let, let's really uh, hammer out this discussion and, and get into the details of, of this chapter and obviously the, the more controversial uh, passages. So Charles just ended with his 10-minute rebuttal. Let's hand it to David. David, will let you uh, start us off with the discussion. Floor is yours, gentlemen. Thank you, Donnie. I will not be going into Leviticus 18.5. I'm going to stay away from that. And so anything 
related to that. And, you know, unless you specifically ask me, then I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, but I'll be short and sweet. What, as Donnie mentioned, definitely want to dig deep into this chapter. Well, now, one of the things I, I want to understand is that you believe that James wrote this epistle uh, specifically just to Christians. In James chapter 1, it says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And I'll get to James 2, but this is important because, you know, why do you think that when it says James, when James says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, why can't we just say to the 12 tribes scattered abroad? Why do you need to add, oh, no, this is just Christians? That's a good question. I mean, honestly, it's based on my assumption that the church didn't begin in Acts 2. Uh, it's my understanding of the diaspora. Which aspect of the diaspora are we talking about? Are we talking about the Assyrian captivity? Are we talking about uh, how the people in Acts 2 that were present at Pentecost were scattered throughout? You know, there, there's all those issues associated with that. But no, I, I, I think it's my presupposition that the church began in Acts 2. So then it's possible, though, that he wrote these to, like, as he said, to the synagogues, to the assemblies. The language in which he uses is extremely uh, Jewish. Therefore, the people within these assemblies, synagogues, could be saved and unsaved as we would use it. You can have a mixed multitude within the synagogues. I'm not denying that. There, then therefore that letter, since it was written to all the individuals within the synagogue, then technically that would mean that it's no longer just talking about physical salvation. It could potentially be talking about spiritual salvation, correct? If in the midst of James teaching, he indicates that he's evangelizing uh, some kind of shift in audience or, or some kind of indicator, then yeah, I, I would say so. Okay. Now in James chapter 2, I'm sorry, in, in Romans chapter 2 verse 13, and this is going to relate to to to, to James. Uh, it says, um, "Excuse me, I'm sorry." Uh, it says, "I'm not sure you know this." For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, I don't believe that's in effect when Paul wrote that, and that's why I said he said, "But now in chapter three, what I want to understand is that is Paul quoting James here." I don't know. So James says, be doers of the law and not hearers only. You don't think there's any connection between those two verses? Oh, I'm not. I don't have a problem with there being a connection. I don't know if it's an exact quote. Uh, it could be that they're pulling both from a, a Old Testament passage as well. I mean, well, I don't, but, I don't, but I have no problem with, with Paul quoting James. James, Paul's not against James. All right. And now the reason I asked that is because one of the, and, and Charles, give me, I mean, Donnie, one second. Don't share my slide yet. Uh, let's see here. Let's do this. All right. Go ahead and share it, please, Donnie. Halfway. Not full. You don't have to go full. All right. Thanks. All right. Now, the reason why, because if I can hone down, if I could say, you know what? James 1 and 2 is focused on the law of Moses. You would agree that my case would be very strong, correct? Yeah, if you assume that the law of Moses is for salvation, yes. And then that's what we discussed in uh, mm -hmm. part one. Got it. Now, with that said, do you think that, do you believe the law can be seen as um, uh, the law of liberty? The actual law of Moses can be seen as the law of liberty in light of Psalm 19 or, and I'll read Psalm 119.45. Or do you think that that in no way, that do you see that as a, do you see that as like a, an oxymoron? No, the Mosaic Law is wonderful. Okay, so then you you could agree that the Law of Moses could be labeled as the Law of Liberty, correct? Yes. Now, understanding that this is all James has, again, nobody else has written anything. This is this is I would I would go out on a limb and say easily this is the first uh, uh, post Calvary epistle written to the the just and the unjust. Understanding that, what makes you think? And where do you get this idea that he was teaching uh, anything other than the law of Moses when he says the law of liberty? I don't have a problem with that because the thing is, is that James probably views it like this. Jesus taught the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. 
and he gave additional revelation because he's the greater prophet. The apostles who have the authority that were given by God have a given additional revelation, and he's in line with that. That's the ripple I was talking about in progressive revelation. Where where do we get evidence that he gave them progressive revel revelation? Well, uh, let's just go with Acts 2. Uh, let's go. Peter makes some statements uh, that I assume that he's uh, speaking as an inspired prophet, that he's not incorrect in what he's saying. You know, I know there's differences about how to understand Joel and all of that stuff. But I believe that that Peter was speaking as the mouth of God. And the apostles were, uh, you know, the tongues of fire. They were anointed. But, they were. But what did he reveal that wasn't already taught in the Old Testament or even prophesied? Like that's what I'm getting at. What, oh. what, what, what new revelation did they, did James have? What I'm saying is, no, James had exactly what he had when he was on Earth with Jesus. What new thing did he have? Did he? What evidence do you have that he had a new revelation? Well, I was responding concerning Peter because what Peter did was he convicted the, the nation of crucifying Christ. And they yeah, that's Christ. a big one right there. Right. So right. He, he used the cross uh, and he used it for shame versus the way Paul used it. So with that said, why don't we see anything? Why don't we see the death, burial, resurrection in James 2 or in any of James? Well, I think the reason that we do see the death, burial, and resurrection in 1 Corinthians is because of the topic there. It's not the topic of James. Had had uh, that issue come up, then the Holy Spirit is able to give that revelation to James. Okay. All right. Now, with that said, are are you, you mentioned and Johnny said this that essentially it's it's temporal or it's, it's you think it's physical salvation. Okay. That's that's you, so that's what you think James is really trying to tell everyone. Hey, this is about physical salvation. Can, can you clarify on that? Well, there's different classes within that. Let me just put it this way. I don't believe that when it's using the word saved in, in James that it's referring to salvation from hell. Okay, why not? Why not? Why not? Because they're already saved. That's my assumption. So, and, okay. And based on uh, how often the word is used, you know, and how I understand it in the Old Testament and in other places of Scripture. Okay. All right. Now, Going back to Romans 2 13, doers of the law, do you not see that there's a connection between doers of the law and then, and when we get to James chapter 2, that he's saying the same thing but a different way and getting a little deeper into it? I'm not even sure he's saying it in a different way because they're both dealing with hypocrisy. Okay. So, so when we hear, like, for example, I meant to 10 and 10, I mean, I should, I should, um, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we know that there's a connection with hearing and faith. We know that. And when I made the argument that in James chapter two, what James is doing is he's going back to what he said in James one, this concept of you have to be a hearer and a doer of the law mm -hmm. of Moses. So. With understanding that, why isn't why how do you see that as just focused on the temporal and not the eternal? Because I go back to the Shema, the Shema heroes are the Lord God is one, and it's all about discipleship, and so that's where I go. And again, that's because you believe that Leviticus 18 5 is talking about the temporal world, correct. Well, I never even knew about Leviticus 18.5 in the way that you describe it. At, mm. uh, but I had already come to the conclusion about Deuteronomy because I've written a paper in theology proper on, on Deuteronomy 6. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's why Got I it. said your passage, Leviticus, is more of a symbolic starting place. There, that concept probably exists in other places in the Pentateuch before Leviticus. Okay. All right, we won't. We're not definitely not going to agree on 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 that. So I'll, I'll I'll move on. That's that's I was dealt with in part one. Now let's 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 get into excuse me. Let's get into deeper into James chapter two. Donny, can you share my screen real quick, please? All right, I want to talk good. about You're this. Good. I want to talk about this person called Abraham. So. I get this all the time. I got when I debate CJ. He said 
you know, he tried to bring up Abraham in his example and then, you know, the Old Testament versus all that stuff. But let's just say, forget it. Okay, we get it. Using Abraham as an example for salvation, I think you'll both you and I will agree in Acts, excuse me, Genesis 15 is is you can't necessarily do that. But I want to help. the. I want to also, I believe, like educate the listeners on this. And, and this is the thing I always ask when I, I and by the way, listeners, I always go back, as you many of you know by now, I, I engage in the comments. I, I will definitely engage. I'm not reading your side chats right now. I'm not getting distracted by that. But I, like, I do like to go and engage. And I go back and I read all the side chats when I watch the video. Now, anyways, one of the things I always get is that I'm always told Abraham was justified, uh, Abraham was justified by faith. And they're quoting Genesis 15. So can we agree right here that Genesis 15 isn't isn't about spiritual salvation yes i agree all right how how would you express that to somebody or teach them hey you know what um you have to understand it this way instead because they're what they're going to want to know is well why did paul use it so why why is paul or or why excuse me why is james using it then in well, chapter two of, of james the first thing I would do, and I do do this in my other videos and stuff and in discussion, is I say, okay, read the context of Genesis 15. He's talking about the promised seed, descendant, you know, of the heir. It's not about how Abraham, Abram got saved. Uh, then I say, okay, now let me tell you the Hebrew argument for why people think it's talking about Abraham. Okay. They basically say that it's sort of like a parenthetical or a flashback to Genesis 12 or some other passage like that. However, there's other options for the Hebrew. I wrote a whole paper on Genesis 15 right. concerning all that for intermediate Hebrew too. Um, so it's not a strong argument. Now, some people will try to go to the different tenses that are used in, in Romans and then the Septuagint, I think, like that, and try to make arguments like that. But even then, aspect comes into play and it's still not solid ground. And if anybody ever wants to debate me on Genesis 15, let's go for it. Now, Abraham has a, he has two seeds, right? What do you mean by two seeds? Well, you have his seed would be like the, the what? Stars of heaven. Okay. And the sand of the sea. Do you believe that, he, that he's talking about two seeds there? That there's a spiritual seed and that there's an actual physical no. seed? No, he's talking about physical seed. Okay. So there's no way, you don't think in any way that when it speaks of the spiritual, uh, the, uh, or sorry, the, the, the heaven, the, the, that that cannot in any way um, be a reference to the spiritual seed future, in the future. I'm aware of the argument about the four seeds and things like that. but I, think I just know it, two seeds. Uh, yeah, there's, there's four, if I remember right, uh, claims you know heavenly earthly and things like that but honestly uh zara is a collective noun and there's times whenever the passage is focusing on the group or 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 the individual that best represents the group and mm -hmm. so uh it just depends on context but no i i don't i tend to not go that approach all right now james too so the, the thing that i find that's uh difficult when grappling with you is it's hard to grasp on something because it's just well my presupposition is that james is written to christians and mm -hmm. and and so there are people that are watching right now there are a lot of people that disagree with you and disagree with me too overall mm -hmm. that faith and works is about it's, it's talking about they think it's a double they think it's a double uh they think it's just a justification before man yeah. And for, you know, if I was debating someone else, that's what our focus would be. So anyways, <laughs> but understand this. If I could prove that James is talking about the, the, the just and the unjust within the synagogues, those who are on their way to um, everlasting life and those who are on their way to everlasting damnation, would that then prove my case? Well, or I'm more open. I'm more open to the idea that, that James could be including believers and unbelievers by the approach you're going through the synagogues as opposed mm -hmm. to CJ's approach. Well, they're viewed as believers, but they're re really not actually believers. It's just a, a rhetorical thing. So I'm more open to that idea because it's plausible. 
because we, we, we know historically, even in Jesus, like we, we know that there were people who attended the synagogues that were unjust. I mean, the letter of James clearly demonstrates that and makes that clear to us. And the reason well, why I think my assumption is most of the people that we think were not saved were saved. Um, mm -hmm. So even in those situations. But so you think that the people, the rich people that are basically despised, you think that's all about they're going to lose their rewards? And if that's the case, again, all I have is the James's epistle. I don't have this revelation that you have that you would have gotten like 20 years later. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what is God thinking? Uh, right. Help me out here. And, that, and let's try to stick ourselves back then during that time. Right, right. So the issue is, is that the concept of rewards, if it is true that crown of life does re relate to the reward idea, then that's fine. Also, Jesus and the Gospels include the idea of rewards in certain areas, you know, plus the Old Testament concerns the concept of inheritance. So you don't need Paul to to argue for those things. It's just that typically what most people do is they see those passages concerning the inheritance or the specific word for a reward. And they assume that it's talking about how to be saved or how to prove that you're saved, which I think it's actually referring to a reward. As far as James 5, talking about reward, it doesn't have to necessarily talk about reward. It could be talking about you're in danger of losing your physical life because of how you're treating other believers. So or, you, I like that. Sorry, Charles, finish. I'm sorry. Or it could be you're in danger of your life because you know uh you're an unbeliever who is persecuting them you could go that route too okay i don't i'm not gonna dismiss that all right so here's what i get you're living an unrighteous life we're let's, we're go we're back 44 we got our, we got our dirty sand dirty feet with our dirty sandals on mm -hmm. and we're about to see a galilee and what you're trying to tell me outside the synagogue where we got a bunch of rich people poor people we're struggling we're trying to make it we're being oppressed by the roman empire you're trying to tell me that if I follow the things that are said in James, that I'm 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 not going to die early, that I'm, I might be able to live an, a long, uh, an old age. What exactly? That's what I want to know. What are you teaching me? What are you teaching me? Let's go. But we're, we're right now outside the style of synagogue in Capernaum. Being, all right. Being that you're familiar with Bullinger, you're familiar with the term autonomy, right? I'm not. OK. If, uh, it's the guy figure, teaches a million things. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Fig if his figures of speech. So sometimes, and, and I know this is not an exact example, but I'll mention it. Like if I say, hey, man, nice wheels. I'm not just talking about the wheels on the car. I'm talking about the whole car, right? So yeah. what I've seen in scripture is that death refers to the consequence for covenant violation or divine discipline. So whether it's actually physically deaf, the point is you're underneath judicial discipline from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so okay. that's how I view it. All right. So we so have it's not, it's not saying that if you're disobedient to God, you're going to drop down dead. No. Do you but, see, though, how that could be um, um, uh, so confusion? Because let's say. All these people are already dying early. There's people who are like literally going to be persecuted. Like, again, I think John, his brother, his letter, the book of Revelation, mm. perfectly ties into James's epistle. Uh, mm. They're even brothers. My goodness. They got to have a lot of commonality. They, these guys said that they asked apparently the same questions. I mean, they, they it's just there's so many similarities. It's amazing. And so what you're trying what I'm trying to understand is I'm a poor person. I don't have anything. And I'm, I'm dead now. I just got killed. I mean, the rich people just killed me. But yet you're trying to tell me, no, 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 no. This is about living a temporal life. This is how you be have a, a fruitful temporal life. That doesn't sound like this is jiving with my my worldview okay. if I'm there right. in that time. You know what I mean? I, no, like, do you I, understand I, what I'm saying? Yeah, I see the issue. Okay, first off, when I talk about my categories of position, experience, and ultimate, Another term for experience refers to temporal life. Another term for that is your walk after being saved. So that's all we're talking about. Now, the issue is, is that uh, God, and we know this from other scriptures and stuff, you even believe that martyrs, now the difference is, I would say the martyrs are rewarded with the crown of life. From, even from the, the extra biblical literature that you believe in, I think that concept is there. 
Um, the, you would say it's for salvation. I would say, no, it's referring to ruling and reigning with Christ. So everlasting life. When you hear that term, do you think rule and reigning? I mean, do you think everlasting applies to what? You don't think it actually applies to, you know, as we usually, most Christians would say, going to heaven. You don't think that's what we're just, you know, you know not going to hell. There was when you a hear time, that. There was a time when I thought everywhere eternal life mentioned that it just referred to how to be saved. Now right. I take it as it's hardly ever referring to that. Like you said, oh. I'm I'm an extreme exper experientialist. <laughs> yeah, so but see here's the thing. And I and 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 to the listeners, I, I I urge you to have a little more respect for the apocrypha as much as um, the early King James translators did and, and even the, you know, I mean, I can just go on and on about it, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this when I brought up in the previous debate and even in the slide here about the martyr from the Maccabean revolt, he specifically makes a connection between him dying for the law of Moses. And because he's going to die, he's going to get eternal life. All right. I'm, I, and so there's a direct connection. I think that right there is 200%, you would agree, is not about the temporal, but it's about the um, eternal, which is everlasting life versus everlasting damnation. I, I, said, I said in the very beginning that there's three aspects to eternal life, position, experience, and ultimate. Now, ultimate mm -hmm. has two subcategories. One, the glorified body, and two, the rewards and reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom. All right. So you... so. Okay, because you're like just about a minute ago, you, you said pretty much everywhere they, the word everlasting life is used. And I know you're not including Maccabees. It's well, simply, I wasn't. I wasn't. Well, my point into that is this: it's hardly ever being saved from hell. So uh, that's all I was meaning. So at that. the judgment seat of Christ, mm -hmm. when they go, they stand. You got everlasting life or everlasting damnation. Do you you have you have either you have either eternal life or you have the second death what do you what do you mean by the judgment seat of christ so i didn't say if i said judgment i apologize but i thought the white throne judgment the white throne okay. judgment i don't think that the great white throne judgment is determining who's uh to be saved it's to determine their degree of punishment in hell so you think that the white throne judgment is strictly only for the unjust I'm not there. It's possible that there may be there may be a time when the millennial saints receive their rewards at the white it, throne. It's possible because it mentions so the then, books, books were open. If the book of life is a, is a book of rewards, then it, it's possible. OK. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, I, I, I don't Let really me jump in, gentlemen, because we've got about 10 minutes left. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if there's the balance that should be um in in uh the discussion portion david you've been asking some fantastic questions i feel like you've been asking about 90 percent of the questions i'd like to see at least in this last 10 minutes charles you to start pressing david on some questions just so we uh, make well, sure that this wasn't just all oh, but that just that this wasn't just a 30 minute cross exam from david so well i mean i want to balance here so go okay, ahead the, the difficulty is if we go into james 2 and, I, and he points out all the activities, the works, the things that, that Abram's doing or everything like that. It's describing a process. David, do you agree that every process begins with, in a point in time in a moment? Yes. Okay. So even if the passages are emphasizing process, it still implies a positional concept. Yes, but not the same, not the same as yours. Okay. Because because I believe in the Old Testament, you you can lose it. Today we can't. I can't. I can't lose it for the life of me. Right. You're you're taking it as, and I I, I see that's an issue with my categories. I mean, but the difficulty with that is, of course, I would say that you that you couldn't lose it. But if you so, that that's the issue I run into. But how could you keep it? So that's the thing. How and, and well. I, and I want, well well, you're not responsible. Uh, well, hold on, hold on. I, I gotta. I need to draw. I need to draw, guys, because it's the only way I can get some clear thoughts on this issue. All right. Can y'all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, God help me in this. Um. So I think the issue is this: is that when we're looking at you know my chart. 
right? Position experience and ultimate. You got six minutes, Charles. Oh my goodness. All right. It's going to take forever. Okay. So you mentioned standing in state, which is in uh, Schofield's rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. A, a position experience and ultimate position was chafer. Experimental is the term he reg uh, uh, used. And then Walbert changed it to experiential. Now, and ultimate are used there. What's your but, standing right now, though? Your standing is you're in Christ right now. Right. And see, that's the issue. How did you though. get there? Okay. How did you get I, there? I understand that by believing at one point in time. No, what the, what what was the agent? What 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 was what 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 put you there? The Holy Ghost put you there. Right, and so you're saying and the Holy that Ghost didn't do that in the Old Testament. You don't know that. I do know that. It's faces. Charles, Jesus made it very clear that the promise of the Father couldn't happen until He was glorified, and that happened. The promise after. of the Father, the promise of the fire, uh, Father concerned the baptism of the Holy Spirit that places one in the body of Christ. Just because the body of Christ didn't exist in the Old Testament did not mean salvation didn't exist. So what you're saying is that the Holy Spirit could regenerate you because you said earlier it couldn't. What I'm getting at is in the Old Testament, you weren't regenerated by the Holy Ghost. There was no regeneration going on while Jesus was on What did I say earlier? Please. Uh, you clarify. said you you you've agreed. You did it in the last debate too that 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 the Holy Spirit didn't regenerate Old Testament saints. No, I think actually what you I would did. say I think what 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 I would say is this is that where the scriptures talk about regeneration in the Old Testament. It's an experiential. Category. They don't. They don't talk about regeneration. Yeah, they do. The, the new covenant passages in Jeremiah. Yeah, that's future, about, by the way. Perfect. That's future. I understand it's future, but it, it goes back to Deuteronomy 30 because it, it talks about. Which is future. I understand it's future, but that doesn't change the fact that they had, uh, that they had, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people bring up the, the statement about Joshua and Caleb having a different spirit. That's not referring to salvation. That's referring to sanctification and their braveness and their faith and okay. things like that. Wouldn't you agree, though, that you need the Holy Ghost to sanctify you? Because that is specifically what three. Wouldn't, uh, you, wouldn't you agree that the Holy Spirit is known as the silent witness, the one that works behind the scenes? No one's denying. The, I never denied the Holy Spirit doesn't work in the Old Testament. So is, it po is it possible that that. Whenever you're talking about progressive revelation, you have first the Father revealed, then you have the promises of the Messiah, and then it's uh, progressive revelation. Then you have the emphasis on the Holy Spirit because he, as it says in First Peter 1.11, uh, of the salvation the prophets looked into, and it said the Spirit of Christ was in all the prophets. So you can have a, 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 a an economic unfolding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Just because the Holy Spirit was not emphasized in the Old Testament doesn't mean that he wasn't involved in salvation in the same way that you can have a trinity in the Old Testament, even though it's not revealed. All right. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration of, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That did not occur in the Old Testament. OK, you're bringing up Paul. All right, number one. Uh, but, what, but because what I'm trying to point out to you is that you are using a model right now that does not fit in the okay, Old Testament. Okay, all right. I don't just, have. All right, so let me ask you a question. When when Jesus said in the regeneration, so and so will happen. What did he mean by that term in the regeneration? Not what Paul meant in three five. He's talking. I'm not he, saying he was I'm talking not, about his kingdom, his kingdom, his future kingdom. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Because the world's going to be regenerated. I mean, okay, that's that's an let obvious me ask one. You, let me ask you about that process. Okay, when we do got the two minutes? All right, when do the Israelites get saved in, in the tribulation? Uh, I, I don't know exactly, but let's try to stick to James too while we can. Let's well, no, land the reason I'm bringing minutes. that up because if if they get saved in the tribulation, then the regeneration that Jesus is talking about is experiential for the new covenant and not positional. Three Titus three five is not in any way. I'm not talking about Testament. Titus three five. I'm talking about Jeremiah thirty one. I'm talking about Deuteronomy Which is thirty. I'm talking about Romans eleven. I'm talking about uh, where Jesus says in the regeneration. I'm making an argument that there's such thing as experiential regeneration. And so when you try to make that these people weren't saved because it's not the millennial kingdom that received the kingdom, I'm arguing that what Jesus wait, 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 talking wait, wait, about. What did I say that? What do you mean with these people? What are you talking about? These the people? one, the Old Testament saints that you think are in Abram's bosom, 
They are. They're, would you agree they're in, would you agree they're neighbor's bosom right now? I don't be, I don't believe in the Old Testament compartment theory, even though people in my camp so, I, I hold okay. the view of Ryrie that Old Testament saints immediately go to be with the Lord. Uh, where's David? Right? Where was David in Acts two? Where does it specifically says that David didn't get didn't go to his, heaven? His body's in the grave. It specifically said it said David. Okay, the David as in all of David. All right, so no, no, let's, because we got a minute the, left. David's tomb. David's tomb was right there in that location, and so Peter is pointing to that and saying David is in his grave. Yeah, that's the no, 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 no. The of, context of corruption so the, is talking about the body. The context was the context was hell, actually, though, like specifically under their feet. Um, but that that's a good one too. But specifically, the context was hell underneath their feet. So in in, in James two, right, right. You would say that because you're going from the King James, and the word hell was used, right? Uh, yeah, and it's the word of God. It's not the King. You call it King James all you want, but it's the word well, of God. Okay. It's the Holy Scriptures. I'm not denying. The only reason you I'm, call it King James is because of all this just, silly confusion. I'm just explaining that I'm going for the Greek text that's underneath that word there. You're going right. from the English text is there. And so it's possible that that could bring in. They're in agreement when it's, you know, it's possible that they're in agreement, which is what I believe. So, so let me get this straight. In James, in James chapter two, you think that when he's talking about, again, we're at the Sea of Galilee, we're just hanging out. You think he's trying to educate me about how to live a, a good physical life? That's literally what you think no, James no, no, 2 no, is about. Uh, no, what it's saying is how do you fulfill the will of God after being saved? It ain't about how do you live the best life. As he wrote it to the 12 tribes. No, 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 he no, wrote listen, it to the non-believers. Listen, non-believers. How do you deal with the word? How do you serve the will of God when you're in persecution, when you're feeling with difficult times? Just as in the Old Testament, wherever you had the blessings and curses, not everybody in the Old Testament experienced Experience all those blessings because that was concerned nationally. So well, according wisdom, to you, because they didn't hold fulfill on, Leviticus hold on, 18.5. Hold on, hold on. Wisdom literature was written in order to explain the tension. James is written in the same vein as wisdom literature. It's explaining to that both even, the unsaved and the saved, or to, to both you, the righteous and the unrighteous. Make, even if you make that argument, it doesn't change the fact that salvation is not by faith plus works. Because it if, does, they're it, it, it if, does. They're, if they're unbelievers, they still need to have the right gospel. If they're believers, they need to be sanctified. The issue is, is that you have the wrong gospel in this particular area. And then you're saying that they have that wrong gospel. Their their gospel isn't our gospel. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom in James. What do you sure. mean Not, by gospel? Word just means message. Good news. Yeah, good news. But you're assuming that that's talking about salvation. I've already mentioned. I'm not assuming. I'm not assuming anything. I've already proved in part one that Leviticus 18, 5, 100, you 200 proved, percent you is all no, about the eternal you proved and the no life such hereafter. Thing. You tried something at the very beginning, which are, I mean, at the end with the chart. And you said, if I put the passage here and position right here, and I'm telling you, by definition, a positional truth cannot include a process. Because processes go here. And Your positional one truths are time. man-made. Okay? okay, if they're man, if they're man-made now, then they're man-made for Paul. And so okay. for your and for you to argue, we don't have that, Paul. We just have James. Even I know that, but the moment that you mm. just said what you said, you made a theological statement, which means we've gone out of exegesis and we've gone into biblical theology and systematic theology. You have already gone to Paul for other things. So that means that if you're going to say that this that this concept that I'm mentioning that every process one last question, Charles, every process begins with an event so, is only so, in Paul, then now you're saying that we're not in Paul. You conceded that it's in Paul. Did you no, or did you not? I conceded what was in Paul. That this distinction between process and event. Is in Paul. What I'm, what I'm trying to tell, I, like I said salvation. in the beginning, like, the three aspects of sanctification are in Paul. Like I said in the beginning, your concept of positional experiential sanctification, your concept of sanctification is not present. Okay, in the twelve, it's not. No, not even close. In you, the twelve, what do you, you mean by the are, twelve? You are you are injecting Pauline teaching. 15 20 years in the past no that is i don't what's think happening. so because it's based on what god's done in the past what god's okay. doing in the present and what god would do in the future the okay. difference is is that you limit god and you say that god cannot be doing these things during this time i'm okay, saying one, they were always present okay one last thing here's you you asked things you can't say 
You can't say this today. So okay. speak ye and in and, and James chapter two. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. If that's the law of Moses, that is the law of Moses. Uh -huh. We would never say that to somebody today. We would never say, so speak ye and so do as they that they, they that shall be judged by the law of Mo law of liberty. That's the law of Moses. Okay, I'm not if, judged by the law of Moses. If it's if it's the law of Moses only, then what the law of Moses is, is the Bible for that time. So the principle is true that one is held accountable by the Bible. And I'm not going to so, talk to I'm not going to give this statement to an unbeliever. I'm only going to give it to a believer. Okay, so, so you're going to give this to an unbeliever. Are you going to give this two things and I'm done. So you're going to give this. This is all the context of James chapter two. You're just destroying what Jesus taught in, in Matthew 19. Okay. In chapter one, verse 27, he says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this to visit the fatherless and the and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Are you going to, is that what you're going to tell, tell me today to do, to live a righteous life? Experientially righteous. Yes. So exper experientially righteous. And so what is that going to do for me? What will that do for me? If I do that, tell me when, when number one, how is it, that going to separate me from an unsaved person going to hell? Because there's a lot of saved unsaved people that can do this better than you and I. Well, what the difference, times. the difference is, is they do it in their own strength and it has no, you're not, look, you need to get into sales because you're not differentiating it in any way from, from the just and the unjust. That's the thing. You're not it's differentiating how they live. The unjust in what sense? Position or experiential? When you make, when you apply chapter 20, it's verse 27 of 9. When you apply that as like, ah, it's just about living a good life here now. And no, I did not future. say that. You are misrepresenting my position. Then, I then tried explain draw, yourself. I tried drawing the chart, but you started bombarding me with things and I only got one dot on there. Right. I would have explained that. You one didn't last give me one. opportunity to. One, one last one. Verse, verse, five of, uh, verse 20 of chapter 5. Let him, sorry, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, that's the law, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You think when it says save a soul from death right there, which goes back to chapter two, you think what? Save a soul from death. You think that's physical death? Really? Really? It's, and you think you think when it says shall hide a multitude of sins? Do you want to know sins, what I think or are you going to keep asserting something? I'm I done and that's it because that, right, I, that, I get, that, that's it. I'm done. I get I'm what good. you're saying. In that context, it's talking about someone that is physically sick and praying for the elders. So it's possible physical sickness and physical death is in view. But once again, I said that death and life are a metonymy for the blessings and the curses that come from God. All I'm saying is that after you're saved, you need to know how to please the Lord. And so whatever revelation God has given at that time, that's what you're responsible so for. In, in, and, when, and, when you, and when you do what the word of God says for you, you are blessed. One it's last thing, I'm done. Get saved. One last thing, I'm done. And the prayer, verse 15, okay? And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up, <laughs> Okay. And if he and and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That's not how we speak. In the last one, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another okay. that he may be healed. You don't talk like that today. Okay, no, you all don't. right. So let's see I'm if done. I don't talk. Let's see if I I'm don't done. talk like that. All right. First off, the word for you sin. say confess your sins. Excuse me. Hold mm -hmm. on. Let me talk. All right. First off, I recognize a distinction just as the Plymouth Brethren do between judicial forgiveness and parental forgiveness. And so judicial forgiveness would be positional and parental would be experiential. In that context, it's talking about someone that's sin and possibly sick. The word for sick can just refer to weakness. So it's not necessarily. But the point is, is that he's talking about how a person can be revealed as it relates to church discipline or if you want to use the term synagogue discipline because when jesus talked about doing these things and doing to the congregation one at a time and so on like that he gave a process of discipline so the process of discipline that's there can be involved there as well so i'm not violating the hide a multitude of sins charles you don't have no sorry I, what do you mean by my sins are already covered? That's I don't not talking it. about your sins. It's talking about the fact that when you go out of the way, that's your presupposition. 
based in on the book, some new in theology the book, founded in this the past in the hundred book, years. In the book of Jude, it talks about making a distinction between some. In the same way, this passage is as well. Because when you rescue a person, when you help them out of their situation. You get your sins you, covered. When you are being useful to God, no. You're cut. You're helping them. Shall had a multitude of sins. Shall had a multitude of sins. It's not talking about the individual sin doing the action. It's talking about restoring the person so that they're no longer living a lifestyle of sin. So that they're no longer in bondage to that. Because we're talking about the law of liberty. It says what it says. It means what it says, Charles. That, uh, Shall had a multitude of sins. That statement is an assertion. Number one, you're assuming what type of sins. Number two, you're assuming what covered. Do you number confess three, your sins number to three, Donnie or anybody? Number who three, do you, who do you, you confess your sins you to? You are assuming the agent of the one who is covering the multitude of sins. It never says in the text, at least from what I'm hearing in the English, that it's saying that the person that's preaching this covers confess the multitude of sins. Confess your faults. Yeah, that's an exhortation to who? We're on the Capernaum Sea. And it's written to me. I'm outside the synagogue, you and I. And I read this and it says, confess your faults. I'm done. Yeah. We're good. I'm good. Well, I'm way over, I think, by the way. Sorry. Leviticus, forgiveness for sanctification is very Faith alone today. Sacrificial sacrifice. Faith alone all today. That stuff. Back then, faith and works. Thank God we're in the dispensation of the grace of God. We got our King James Bible. We're so spoiled. People nowadays, so spoiled. Super spoiled. <laughs> all right guys uh i let that go for an extra 10 15 minutes because oh. it got a little spicy at the end there and uh that's good because when you're so calm for two hours it, it, it's good to get a little and that was charles uh, you know, wcw in there <laughs> or wwf whatever one um okay uh, great stuff. Appreciate the the uh, discussion. For anybody just joining us, this has been a very comprehensive uh, debate because we are going at the two hour and 20 minute mark now. We've had uh, 20 minute opening statements, cross exam, uh, rebuttals. This was the discussion portion that we got uh, to enjoy for about 42 minutes here. And now we're going to uh, we're going into closing statements. So, uh, David, we're going to start with you. You've got five minutes in terms of your uh, concluding statement. And whenever you're ready, just let me know. If you got to share a screen, let me know as well. And uh, we'll go from here. One second. The timer ready. Okay. All right. Timer on. Share screen. The author of the book of James is James Zebedee. He wrote a letter to the rich and the poor of the nation of Israel. After Calvary, James still maintained the Jewish teaching taught by Jesus that in order to gain eternal life, one had to keep the law of Moses. James even continued to teach that one's sins could be covered by performing good deeds. Nowhere in his epistle does he mention the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15. His struggle is with the rich ruling elite amongst the 12 tribes scattered abroad. The rich oppress the poor, meek, and are only hearers of the word and not doers also. Thereby, they will not receive the crown of life, which is eternal life. James maintains that works are necessary to receive eternal life by pointing to the law and Abraham. James is seeking to prepare the 12 tribes for the coming of the Lord. Jacob's troubles are on the horizon. Therefore, Jewish believers were rightly expecting the Lord to return during their time not 2,000 years later. You can stop searching. You can pull away. Donnie. That is how I began the debate. I clearly demonstrated that what I said in my thesis is, I believe, accurate. My interlocutor, my opponent, my brother, my friend, he did not in any way demonstrate that James was for uh, o was only for believers, the just. In fact, I think to the contrary, he gave room that James could be written to the just and the unjust, to those who are going to be damned to everlasting damnation and those who are going to be given life eternal and to live forever, have access to the tree of life. What I tried to do was most definitely difficult seeing that I'm debating someone who 
really teaches something that is completely false, that the entire Bible was only directed towards those who were already saved positionally and working it out experientially. I do believe that this concept of positional and experiential and ultimate are accurate terms. I, as you noticed when I was speaking to you all, I wasn't using these theological terms. Or if I did, I def definitely didn't use them as much as my opponent did. My goal is to try to sit down almost 2,000 years ago and act and put myself in their shoes outside the synagogue in Capernaum or in Spain somewhere and imagine myself just reading the epistle of James with what I have before me. You will never, ever, ever get anything or maybe most of what Charles said to us tonight in James's epistle or in the law of Moses, prophets, Psalms, and law. I plead with you. I exhort every one of you to examine what I've said. Look at how I approach this interpretation of James chapter 2. Again, I do not believe that this applies to us today. I do believe that it will apply in the tribulation, which thank God I will not be here. But understand this, that James was written to the nation of Israel. He makes it very clear, but yet my opponent adds to the word of God. He specifically says that it's addressed to the Jewish Christians. There's no evidence for that. I believe James of Zebedee was the author. I believe that he was traveling around the Roman Empire. I believe that when he came back to Israel, that he was eventually beheaded because he wrote such a controversial, fiery letter to the unjust, to the rich. There's a lot we can learn from this letter. We can, all, we can apply a lot of this today. But if there's anything you get in what I've said today, it is how to properly rightly divide the word of truth. With that, I close. Thank you, David, for your five-minute concluding statement. We're going to hand it over to Charles now. Charles, you've got a five-minute concluding statement as well. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, I, I'm just going to respond in light of, in hand of what uh, David just said. Okay, the first thing is, is that he said I should be in sales. I think he should actually be in sales because what he did was he delayed his key evidence or support in a mystic confusion uh, concerning James 5. Yeah, he alluded to it and prepared that, but that was his clinching thing. And I think that that was a, a, a shrewd tactic, but I will challenge him in the future if he ever wants to uh, do a careful exegesis of James 5 and discuss that. The other thing is, is that really what this comes down to is that have I proved or disproved dispensational salvation? See, David holds to dispensational salvation. I believe that salvation is the same in every dispensation. It's those presuppositions that we both have that affect how we understand the passage. Yes, true. He agrees that it doesn't refer, uh, it doesn't have to refer to the tribulation. We get that. It could be an application. That's not the real issue. The issue is how to understand Jesus's words in the Sermon on the Mount, which he believes goes all the way back to Leviticus 18, which I have no problem with because I see it's concerned in experiential sanctification. Now, the thing is, is that I am open to possibilities if they're plausible concerning the, the text. And, and uh, um, he says that it's difficult to debate me because of, of the certain assumptions and stuff. I understand that the word position is difficult because he's thinking only in terms of position in Christ. But there's also position as it relates to covenant. And you could even say there's position in God. The, as for the concept of theological terms, the moment you use an English translation, you have already engaged in theological terms. Nothing's wrong with theological terms. And, and uh, the terms, you know, that's not a real issue. I appreciate his attempt to bring it into context. That's always a goal for us. And it challenges me to think about, you know, 
Are there times whenever I'm reading Paul in there? I love that concept. I am very passionate about the discipline of biblical theology, and that's definitely what it's about. And I hope to write my next paper, at least after this class I'm in now, because I'll probably do 1 Corinthians 15, on James. Now, I want to clarify something. Number one, I believe that the law of Moses came to an end as to as to regulation concerning sanctification as a rule of life at the cross. Okay, that's important for understanding the statements concerning law of liberty and those things like that is mentioned there. In other words, when James is talking about the law of liberty, he's using the Old Testament as his Bible. It, it, I made this distinction in the last debate, but I'll make it here again, is that there's a distinction between saying something is the revelation of God and applying it and principles properly interpreted as opposed to saying it's the regulation. He's assuming that just because the law of liberty is being used, that it's being used for salvation because he assumes the salvation is through that. All right. So that's what I want to mention. far as him saying I added to the words of calling it Jewish Christian, I'm just trying to classify things. Yes, I'm assuming that the church began in Acts 2, but he's assuming that the church didn't begin in Acts 2. And maybe that will be a future debate. When did the church begin? But those are issues that are determining James. No matter how much context you try to talk about, no matter how much you talk about us walking in the sandals of James, James is walking after Pentecost. And so if Pentecost is when the church began, then that allows for the possibility that Acts 2 dispensationalism is true. And that's where the debate is. These other passages, they're only deals with nuances. In fact, in my seminary class, which we're interacting with this, which is on Acts and Paul, I wish it was Acts and James, we were taught, someone asked the question, if you made the argument that James concerned the tribulation, would that be wrong, you know, concerning, would, that, would you be going into hyper dispensationalism? And the professor said, no, it's just an attempt to identify the audience. I commend a David on an attempt to identify the audience. I hope that eventually he'll come to a position wherever he's not just free grace in the church age, but teaching lordship salvation everywhere else. And uh, I pray that he continues studying Dillo. I pray that he continues to challenge me to read certain things and vice versa, and that y'all are challenged by this. We're going to continue having a dialogue. And continue to kick the ball forward. And that's all I want to say. God bless. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for those five-minute concluding statements. As always, uh, with these soteriology debates, very thorough, very comprehensive, and lots of interesting points discussed. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great verse to discuss and debate. And even after two and a half hours, we could probably do another two and a half hour debate. So uh, 30 second break for the debaters here who have some phenomenal endurance. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this debate concluded another uh, week long debate marathon on Standing for Truth. So the previous week, we had five debates on all sorts of topics. This week, we had another, uh, we had four debates, obviously tonight on uh, James 2. Earlier in the week, we had uh, a, another debate in our Evolution Debate Challenge series, Kent and Horazio. This one was a ton of fun. Uh, we also had a debate on uh, Bible translations. Is the King James Bible the only infallible source and norm for theology, Will Kinney and Mark Gageton. And then uh, last night, we had a debate on the nature of God. So was Jesus fully God and fully man during his earthly ministry? Matt Slick, Stanley Terry. It's been a fantastic week. Tons of fun. I want to thank the audience uh, because for every debate, we've had so many great questions and uh, so much awesome engagement from the chat. These topics are important. And so it's it's a real blessing to see so many uh, you know interested and, of course, engaged in it. So tomorrow we have off, one day off here, and then we're back on Monday uh, for the main event of the summer. Dr. Dino, his 300th debate, and Dr. Jay Bundy. He's a PhD evolutionary biologist, so uh, probably the perfect interlocutor for uh, for this debate, evolution on trial. So this one is Monday at um, this one's Monday at eight, 
And then on the 31st, which wraps up the summer of debates, we've had a ton of debates. It's been a great summer. Uh, Turretin Fan and CJ Cox, Eternal Conscious Torment and Conditional Immortality. And then uh, the first uh, week to two weeks of the summer, we have our Defending Genesis Conference. So, uh, all right, break time's over, gentlemen. Great job so far, David and Charles. And we've always got a, a fantastic audience Q&A. So the debate typically continues into the audience questions. And let's start right at the beginning, almost two and a half hours ago. This comes in from Praise I Am. And Charles, this one's for you. So as always on this channel, you both have been here before many times. And so whoever the question is for, make sure they get the last word. That way we can move on smoothly. So Praise asks, Charles, what would Charles say works of faith are in 1 Thessalonians 1.3 and 2 Thessalonians 1.11? Go ahead, Charles. Well, just look at from the English. When you use the word works of faith, you're identifying a genitive. And so you have different uh, arguments or classifications with that. But in short, I think the whole statement, and I haven't looked at the text yet, but I think the whole state, my assumption is, is ex experiential. It's talking about applying yourself after being saved. All right. Thank you, Charles. David, anything you'd like to add? Oh, I think you're on mute, David. I would, I would just like to add that when you hear the word works, it's not necessarily always applied to how I, how I was using it in James chapter two. Okay. That's pretty simple. And uh, I would point the the uh, the question of praise I am to uh, Galatians five six, uh, for we through sorry uh, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. That's all I have. David, appreciate it. Charles, last word goes to you. If you had anything you wanted to add. Well, number one, the issue is James. You know. He's quoting Paul. And so, you know, according to the, what this debate consisted of, neither one of us would argue that for Paul, you know. Uh, uh, and so James, uh, according to David's view, would teach salvation is faith plus works. And 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 he would say in Paul that it's possible that's sanctification. Uh, so that's the issue is that the dispensational distinction, if it is a dispensation distinction okay gentlemen thank you so much next question um comes in from greg johnson and i believe this one's for you charles but regardless we're going to get uh, we're going to get both of your input in here greg johnson asks how can one work out his salvation if no works go ahead charles. Well, first, well first off philippians i think the workout salvation is not positional it's experiential uh, Paul is talking about the for them to apply their faith concerning the missions offering because he's gathering an offering that talks about at the end of, end of Philippians and things like that. He's talking about participating with them. Uh, that's one approach. Another approach is some people will say, well, you can't work out what's been worked in you. And so it's therefore the result of it. But I don't take it as a positional passage. David. Over to you. Can you pull it up, please? I haven't memorized this verse. I, mean, I know it, but I just, I'd rather just or just give me a second, one second, okay? Yeah, I can get it too. Uh, what do you mean, baby? You don't have the whole Bible memorized? That's no, a requirement for debates here. <laughs> Pretty much. He's not, he's not Van Impey. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He did have some good qualities. Uh, um, what that's, uh, okay, so wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and troubling uh again yeah i would just the one i would i would ask the questioners please just try to focus on james you know but anyways uh the thing is is when paul uses the word worketh or work uh i don't believe in any way he's using it the same way that's being applied in in um in that so if you want to know really what that verse means save that for uh, another debate i'm going to focus really primarily on james so Come on, listeners, let's go. Get with it. No offense to the question. No offense to the questioner. Sorry. Unfortunately, Maybe in the all... comments. Okay. Appreciate it, David. Charles, go ahead. Final word. 
Well, I think interpretation and exegesis is more important than uh, biblical theology, systematic theology. We're challenged here to debate what's the best exegesis for James 2, and Philippians didn't exist at that time. So that's how I reply. Okay, so next question comes in from, uh, let me see here. Okay, so this one comes in from Facts and Conspiracy. At Standing for Truth, can you ask both interlocutors how they know they have interpreted the Bible correctly instead of incorrectly? And how sure are they on a scale of 0% sure to 100% sure? Um, I guess Charles uh, started with the last two questions. David, if you want to start with this one, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's always going to be by faith. It's To me, it's not blind faith. Uh, it's, it's the same. It's the same principle. I mean, in many ways, I'm the way I'm looking at James. I would, you can look at it in many ways the way you look at any other document. I mean, first off, like I said, it's a, it was a letter. I believe it was an actual real letter. I think there's plenty of evidence to point that it was actually a real letter, and what we're reading is actually accurate. And so, at the end of the day, it's like, well, can you, did you actually read through? Of course, I did. I didn't read it. I don't know. But I take, I look at that by faith, and I proceed. And so when I look at these connections, and this is why I brought up this connection with James and Spain, and I made it very clear too that I mean it's 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 tradition, and I don't want to. It's, it's that tradition is not actually a bad word, but I mean let's just look at it from a negative view. Uh, this idea that James lived in Spain, uh, I think, has a very or went to Spain, and even his bones were there. I mean, what if his bones are in Jerusalem? I get it, but I ask myself, wait a minute. I mean, the same, like, wow, are these people lying so much and so stupid they can't even get this right? And so at the end of the day, when it comes to where I'm at with faith and works in James, I would say on a scale of zero to one, I'm 100 percent on where I'm at. But I, but I'm also grounded in, in a faith rooted in and I believe many infallible proofs. And then lastly, just understand that when I'm looking at this this chapter, this book, I'm literally, literally looking at it as like an actual letter, historical document. I think if James saw us right now debating, he'd be like, wow, you, you, what are you doing? Like, how many books do you have on my letter that I wrote? This is crazy. Uh, but at the same time, I think you can say, you know, I, I kind of get it. Because at the end of the day, we, by faith, believe that what we're reading is the very, very words of God. Thank you for that response, David. Charles, floor is yours. Yeah, um, number one this questioner expects me to be able to interpret their words properly. And so it's the same with any document that whenever a writer writes something, they expect their audience to be able to understand something. Now are some things lost in communication? Yeah, there is. If there's, if you're just talking about finite, but if you believe in the doctrine of inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, you know, those related concepts and things like that, then, you shouldn't have a problem with the idea that God is able to communicate his truth. Now, that doesn't mean I fully understand it. I'm making a distinction between inspiration and illumination of the text. I could be totally wrong, but based on the text, which I believe the meaning is in, and based on the context that I understand, I come to the conclusions that I have. Now, my conclusions are tentative and preliminary. I may eventually join uh, David's camp. Or, or I think it's possible he could join my camp. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not my responsibility. I can't say what I will and what I won't do, except I pray that I will continue to study as deep as I can. And I encourage I encourage the skeptic, the conspiracists, uh, to also be skeptic of their conspiracy and of their own questions. God bless. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your responses, there, gentlemen. Next question comes in from Mark Gageton. Another question for the both of you. Can both debaters give their definition or understanding of what it means for a book of the Bible to be canon? Uh, Charles, why don't we start with you this time? Go ahead. Well, if I were to use the term canonical, what I'm talking about is the revelation of God. But most people, so you could say that there's an objective canon and then there's a subjective canon. The subjective canon is what the church councils re, uh recognized by certain criteria to be what the objective canon is uh so i mean really that's all i want to say i'm referring to the 66 books of the bible i don't know if david believes the apocrypha is inspired literature you have to ask him about that or maybe he can clarify that um god bless go ahead david 
it, again, it kind of related to the last question. It's going to always come down to faith. And this is what some people don't like. And, and I'm that type of person. I'm, I'm an ultra skeptic. I mean, I'm, I'm the type of person that's like, like I'm going to go where I'm, I'm going to Mount Sinai because I want to see some Mount Sinai myself. And I want to check it out. I'm, go, I'm going to go to where I think the, the crossing is, uh, for, or the crossing of the Red Sea is. Uh, I mean, I'm actually trying to plan a trip for that right now. So, you know, I, 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 I try to sympathize with those who think outside of faith, you could say, like, no, I don't want to go on the realm. But at the end of the day, when, when I come with something like what's canonical, canonical, uh, I ultimately have to go, this is my standard. And if you saw my debate last week on new, ver new Bible versions, uh, how I um, clearly proved that they're all perverted and dangerous and untrustworthy, this is my standard, my King James Bibles. This is where I start right here. And I take that by faith. And someone will say, that's crazy. Like, so this is where you got these people, these 1600, these, these 17, 17th century people. And that's where I ultimately start. And this is where I look at. That's it. That's all. And people can laugh at me. They can say whatever they want, but I don't care. I'm moving forward. So it's faith and my faith in the King James Bible. And from there, what I was given, I look at it and that's where I start. And everything that keeps coming at me, all these people throwing showing mistakes or everything, it's still standing. It's still the king. It's still the monarch of books. It's the greatest book that's ever been on earth. It's the most sold. And specifically when I'm talking about the Bible, I'm talking about this right here where I'm holding it in my hand. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, Charles. Okay, next question comes in from Mistletoad. And um, I think this one, judging by the questions, probably for you, David. So Mistletoad asks, if not by works, lest any man should boast, why would it some other times be by works that you can boast in? Go ahead, David. Uh, this is our question somewhat. Uh, so, okay, so I, I get it. Um, well, there's a there's a misunderstanding of uh, boasting essentially when it comes to how Paul was using it versus how one could use it in the Old Testament. Uh, there there are things that someone could, I guess you could say, boast in. Like for example, uh, if it was a covenantal approach, um, God, I did this, and that that's that's my point is that we're not under a covenant right now. We're we're not like if I do this. If I, if my actions are like this, if I perform this, then I'm going to get this. Okay. So there's no boasting in that because God's like, what are you doing? I, I got it. It's already right here. Versus in the old Testament, there was this ability to say, Hey, like when we see this in David, Hey, I did this. I did that. God, I deserve this. Therefore I should get this. I'm boasting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, cause God said, Hey, if you do this, then you get that. Well, we do it all the time. Hey, I won this. I did this. Therefore, I'm I'm boasting. I'm 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 letting the world know how I did it. But in um, under this dispensation, which we're in, we're not. It's not a covenant system. It's not a system where we're like, okay, um, again, if you do this, you get that. Because because there's nothing to boast about. It was God's grace that completely uh, just given us the the gift of self, um, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost and uh, eternal life. All right. Thank you, David. Charles, over to you. Oh, Charles, you're on mute. The word boast is sort of like the word proud or pride. It can be used in a negative sense or a positive sense. I think the important thing to recognize is that there's not a one-for-one -one correspondence, even in the Old Testament. Like I explained before, you could call it trickle-down blessing because God promised to bless the nation. And so when you see certain trends, you would say God is being faithful to his covenant. But that didn't mean every individual Jew within the nation that their sin or their uh, their individual choices affect their temporal lives in the sense of receiving how much crops or, or things like that. It was more of uh, uh, so that you could get an indicator that the Lord was displeased with the nation. And as I explained before, the reason that the wisdom literature was written was to explain that tension. Wait a minute. Why is it that the wicked prosper, you know, even among the nation? You know, what's going on or why am I not getting the blessings that I that 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 I thought we would get from the covenant? And so it clarifies those issues. Um, and honestly, I bet you those passages about boasting are experiential. They're not positional. OK, thank you. And David, question was for you. So if you want the last word, go ahead. And I, I want to go back and kind of emphasize this, this idea of understanding what it was like under the covenants versus how it is now. Uh, I, you have to understand, you, you need to know that, for example, when Abraham 
was um, got the cup of, you know, God said, hey, if you, if you believe if I multiply thy, thy seed as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea, uh, um, then I will do this for you. OK, that that was like that was he was nothing. He can boast in that. Uh, but if you move forward outside and especially when going to the Mosaic Covenant, it was very clear. Hey, if you do this, then I will give you this. And we see clear examples in Psalms of David, essentially what we would call boasting. He's uh, and others saying, I did this, so I deserve that. And again, the emphasis in today's dispensation is not like that. And the last thing, I mean, one last thing, if you could share the screen, it's related to this question. You can't share the screen. Thank you. What I want everyone to understand is that we are talking about a time. And again, this is why I emphasize also that the Re Pauline revelation, and as you notice, almost every single question is about Paul. Okay. And so um, every, th this is why I made this chart. I made this, I made it pretty much, I guess, for myself. Uh, but I wanted to point out to everyone, and I know it was quick when I showed it, but that Paul doesn't even write his first letter until AD 54. Okay. And we have to understand the Acts, the Acts Council of AD 52 was what? 17 years at, at, uh, after Paul, Saul's conversion. And they're still having these questions. Look, you might not agree with me, but you have to at least agree that this idea of faith in works was still being worked out. What many of you will say is, oh, well, the Jews, they're corrupt. They don't know what they're doing. They're perverted. They perverted the, the doctrine. So it's so borderline, almost anti-Semitic. It's scary. But that's essentially where you're going to have to go. And when I had that discussion a few weeks ago with Kingdom in Context, I clearly saw you have this huge group of people, not huge, mate. you have this group of people that are like, like, like this is the law, it's the law, you have to keep it. And I even asked some of the questioners, so should I be stoned? No, because there's no Levite, no, no, no Levitical priesthood. Then we move over to the Charles spectrum. It's like they, they don't want to admit that, yeah, you know what? There is a dividing line. There's clear, there's clearly something. And, and I advise the questioner, please study Acts 15. All right, David, thank you for that final word on that, uh, on that question. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next question that comes in from Seraph D. And this one is for Charles. Charles, um, questioner is asking, question for layman. Do you know of any scholars or historical church leaders who hold your specific position or opinion on James 2? Well, if you're assuming my opinion is that James 2 is not talking about salvation uh, by faith through works, of course I do. I can recommend Dr. William Varner, a master seminary, even though he's lordship, he has an ex a, a excellent exegetical commentary. Of course, he wouldn't come to the same conclusion as free grace, but he's a very gracious man. Of course, you can check Constable's Notes, which is a free commentary that's updated uh, every, uh, every year. You know, just type it in and search the book and you can get resources concerning that. As for your uh, as for history and stuff, I mean, do you really expect for church history to have all correct doctrine or is it that God can give progressive elimination to the church? You know, so that's all I'll say for now. OK, appreciate it. Uh, David, is there anything you want to add on that one? Yes. When the story goes, as you all know, Luther, what opened up his eyes when he read the just shall live by faith. He read Paul. And so what people have to understand is that what I believe is that essentially for the past almost now still 2000 years now, I feel like almost is that you have like this. People don't really understand Paul and they're not putting him in in context properly. And it turns out that even Luther wanted to expel the book of James from the from the from the Bible. Now, how does that re relate to your question? It, it, I think it relates a lot. And here, here's how. Um, ultimately, uh, this position that I hold is is very, very rare. OK, the uh, uh, Peter Rockman, uh, who I know is definitely vinegar in, in to many people, um, uh, maybe Stam, but even Bullinger or Schof Schofield don't hold to my view of the book of James as far as uh, Charles goes. I mean, it's kind of sad because if you think if it, if it was even close to being true, that we would see evidence in history. And that's one reason why I always go back to the Second Temple, because I'm always asking myself this question. If this is true, if there's any hint of it being true, and that, for example, Paul is should be our primary focus in, on doctrine and for, for the church today, 
Hence, Luther took that, and he that's what opened up eventually him and Erasmus opened up the Reformation. But here's ultimately what I'm saying is, if there was any truth in what Charles had to say, I think that we would see evidence of that, historically speaking, prior to the 20th century. We don't. Thank you, David, for your response. Charles, you can have the last word. Question was for you. I'm still not understanding what the that is that David, uh, you know, concerning that issue, because uh, there are tons of people in church history, if you count everyone that's commented on scripture, that believe that salvation is by faith alone, that have differences on James 2. But just because I come to I come to a different exegetical conclusion on how to interpret the passage doesn't mean that I come to a different doctrine. And that's the issue is that you have few people that teach salvation by faithless works and you got other people that teach salvation by grace through, uh, uh, through faith. Now the difference is with the hyper dispensationalists, sorry for using that term right, Pauline dispensationalists, is that they they want to have their cake and eat it both uh, eat it too. And so they say that salvation is by faith through grace in the church age, but James too is not the church age, and so it's by faith plus works. So any other time. And so to to argue that my view is not historical, what world do you live in? Just find any conservative, either free grace or lordship, and they will argue. Go back to the Wilkin debate. The Catholics wouldn't have nothing to argue about if my view didn't exist in, in church history. God bless. Okay, thank you, uh, Charles, for that final word. And uh, next question that comes in is from Mark Gageton. Again, to the audience, thank you so much for, as always, sending in so many awesome questions. I really do uh, look forward to the audience Q&A portion of these debates. So Mark Gageton asks, question for both. Um, how through or by what does the Holy Spirit work in people? Through the word or apart from it? Um, anybody want to volunteer in terms of answering first? Sure, I'll go for it. Sure, go. Uh, well, I would, I would definitely say... Uh, both uh, understand this so that I'm very cautious on uh, saying that the Holy Spirit led me to do something. The Holy Spirit uh, guided me. And I, I harp on a lot of people on that. And I get a lot of, I get a lot of heat for that because I personally believe most Christians today that their faith is rooted in um, experience and emotions and not the scriptures. And I mean that, and I mean, I would say 99% because usually when I, when I, I know disagree with somebody, I'm attacking their faith and usually, I'm, I'm especially within the charismatic movement, I'm attacking their experiences. And, and that's what their faith is ultimately rooted in. Now, in regards to how the Holy Spirit works, that's why I'm always cautious saying, is the Holy Spirit, when I did my lesson tonight, like you will never hear me say, because I'm being safe, that the Holy Spirit guided me in my lesson tonight. And therefore, you know, that's how I got to where I got to tonight. Uh, and, and that's dangerous because um, ultimately, just imagine if I actually said that then everything I just said tonight is basically infallible. And if Charles disagrees with me, then then shame on him. I mean, it's, it's just so silly when people say it. So I know people say it like, kind of like, just like as a filler a lot of times too, but be careful. But how does the Holy, so, so what I usually do, and this is why I'm so strong on this, is because the place that I know for sure that I don't have to be like, is it working through me? Is it working through him? Is right here. This is where I go right here. My, my, my authorized version, my Holy Bible, my King, my King James Bible, the greatest book in the world. So this is what I ultimately believe that the Holy Spirit, this is where my focus is, primarily works through us. He's the author of it. He wrote it and I read it. So when the Lord speaks to me, it speaks to me right here. That's how he speaks to me. Not audibly, not like, well, not through some um, foolish experience. Appreciate the answer there, David. Uh, Charles, floor is yours. Yeah. Um, can you bring up the pre the question? You switched it on us. Yeah, Mark oh, is yeah, just um, he, he's just clarifying. So the, his question is related uh, to the claim that the Holy Spirit did not regenerate people in the OT. And then well, here's the question. Uh, you know, let me answer this because he should have made it more clear. Um, and I'm, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it, this is important because in the last debate, I made some categories that I put in a recent paper. 
uh, concerning salvation and sanctification, I would say first off, you have the regulatory means of sanctification. I mean, the revelatory means of sanctification is that the Bible be remains the word of God, regardless of whether that code or covenants in operation. Then you have the regulatory means of sanctification, uh, which is the rule of life that's in, in, in power at that time uh, in place. Then you have the experiential means of sanctification, which is the sanctification aspect. And then you have the enabling means of sanctification. So yeah, you can say that God's word and the Holy Spirit are always involved. The Holy Spirit has a different ministry for unbelievers than he does for believers. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the ministry, and also to restrain evil. The ministry for the Holy Spirit is regeneration and dwelling, baptism, sealing, and all that. Just because some of those ministries did not exist in the Old Testament that we know of uh, does not mean that the Holy Spirit was not active. Johnny, can I add? Because the, he kind sure, of changed the ahead. question. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, I know he's not. I wonder how the Holy Spirit restrains evil. I don't know if, if you're talking about two Thessalonians, you better watch Johnny's video. Anyways, um, but all right. So uh, let me let me say this. Nobody was regenerated in the Old Testament by the Holy Ghost. I will debate anybody on that. You will never, ever be able to prove that, especially in light of John chapter seven, which says that, uh, excuse me, it says, but this is speaking of what he's talking about being the, the true about um, uh, in context of uh, uh, the spirits work in, in John chapter seven. And he says, but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And then when you keep studying, you go on to the comforter and the promise of the father. And then you move forward into Acts chapter 15. And then you proceed into this, even verses like J uh, Titus 3, 3, 5. Titus 3, 5 is key. And if you if you can demonstrate to me that Titus 3, 5 took place in the Old Testament, I'll give you $2 billion. Now, is that $2 billion in IOUs or like actual? <laughs> I'll get to $2 billion. <laughs> Hey, listen, I'll get the $2 billion just as quick, just as quick as you can answer that question right. Ooh, that's there you go. good. That's good. <laughs> that's a lot of surfer competitions. <laughs> hey, we're hitting inflation. Come on. We can that's do it. That's true. Good point. Good point. Okay. Uh, next question comes in. And uh, for the both of you again, so this is great. We've got a lot of questions uh, directed at the both of you. So, um, and David's got his glasses on now. So that means he means business. Uh, Centurion three seven or seven three seven asks question for both uh, guests. Does First Corinthians five five apply to James two as once saved always saved? And I can also um, try and get that up on screen too. First Corinthians five, five I believe. And uh, David started with the last one. So Charles, why don't we start? Uh, have you start with this one? uh i'll put it up on screen well first off i want to reiterate what david's been saying what i'm saying paul's revelation didn't exist at that time however i do believe that god disciplined people because we see that in the book of acts and and i severe were possibly saved and god killed them so if 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 first corinthians 5 5 is talking about divine discipline for that then uh i don't see the problem and uh, can you bring up the question one more time yeah Once saved, always saved. Okay, so your issues with once saved, always saved. Once again, I brought up temporal discipline, not an issue there. And James 2, in my view, is sanctification, so not an issue there. God bless. Oh, God bless. Thank you, Charles. Over to you, David. Good question, but it's, you know, I guess you can kind of say, again, you're bringing up Paul, which is there. And it's cool because I expect you all to do that. I get it. I get it. Uh, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I'm not, I'm not knocking you or anything. Uh, but that's why, if you could share my slide, that's why I did the slide I'm about to show you. Now, um, first off, I 100% believe that First Corinthians 5.5 5 is, is focused on, on temp. Definitely, I would agree definitely with Charles, focus on temporal. This is, this is not about, um, it's not about one's lo losing salvation. Uh, ultimately, um, you know, one thing I, I need, I, I would like people to understand too, is if I'm saying, Paul's saying one thing, James, Peter, and John are saying another thing wait a minute, what's going on here? And so they, they obviously were crossing each other, not, they were crossing each other. And, and what I did is 
This is from uh, Randy White. I actually really like it because usually when we talk about dispensations or the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God, it's like back to back. And I'm like, that can't be. And so one, one of the things that you will find in early Pauline epistles specifically is that you will see um, a lot of um, a, a, a kingdom offer in relationship to the gospel of the kingdom. Because again, like I said, Paul when he wrote Romans, I believe he wrote it mostly to to to, to the Israelites and uh, Gentiles were included in some of it. But I don't believe that Romans 11, for example, is talking about these Gentiles being grafted in. Uh, I don't believe that at all. And I do believe that when the word saint is used, that it's used um, every time it's used uh, um, with uh, it's applying to uh, say, uh, Jewish believers. And I know for many of you, that's like I never heard that. I highly advise that you take a look at Randy White's, uh, go to Randy White Ministries and take a look at his, um, who are the saints. It is fascinating, man. He nails it. There are, there is one scholar that, you know, I have to, there is one scholar that actually does agree with Randy White. From um, I was actually surprised. But anyways, hopefully I'm not rambling, but I do want to say this in this chart, and I'll, and I'll stop. In this chart, or in, sorry, in, in this diagram, or however you want, this drawing, whatever, uh, I, what I'm trying to emphasize is that the gospel of the kingdom ended up ended up like di like i don't want to say digressing but any taking a lower space a lower spot while the gospel of the grace of god expanded throughout time because again like i said earlier that the gospel of the kingdom was being extended kept being extended extended to the nation of israel i do believe that paul there will think there will be things in paul's letters that you'll find you're like hmm, that's definitely sounds like a little gospel of the kingdom hebrews for example i'm done all right, David, thank you so much. And um, we are over the three hour mark and time has flown by. These debates are so much fun, very edifying. You both did a fantastic job with your uh, presentations and answers here. So let's do one final question. And uh, this one is for Charles, A's philosophy. So um, Charles, if salvation is not of works, does one have to obey Christ's commands to be saved it's it's funny that he addressed my wife but okay <laughs> but i think they were having a little back and forth yeah yeah well like i said like i said chat. well i mean if salvation is not a works, does one have to obey christ's commandments to be saved well if salvation is not of works does one have to obey christ's commandments to be saved okay let me get this first part if salvation is not of works, which I believe it's not, does one have to obey Christ's commandment to be saved? That doesn't make, I, I'm sorry, I'm, maybe my mind's not being clear, but I don't think that works. He's got a statement in there. I, I, can I, I come back and try? David, you want to try to make sense of that? Sure. And a, A's philosophy, if you can maybe add a little more, that'd be great. Anyways, so uh, I think one of the things, and I got this when I, uh, my discussion, and it wasn't a debate with Kingdom and Context with Sean. Uh, basically, w one thing I got was th this idea that we need to keep, we need to keep the law of Christ. We need to keep, and they would auto, always uh, 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 equate with like commandments every single time. And I don't believe commandments every single time is, is talking about the Mosaic law when Paul uses it. Again, I think Paul reveals things that are clearly, clearly not presented by the 12. And therefore, when if he's referencing that, that's the thing I wish you would clarify. If he's referencing, for example, Paul is talking about keeping Christ's commandments, um, then he needs to understand that when Paul's using it, he's oftentimes you've you got to understand that he's not using it in, in the same way as uh, um uh, the 12 are using it and one last example is when when i was uh, having a discussion at the end with sean and the kingdom of context uh video is he brought up irenaeus and he said hey look irenaeus uh you know he talks about how you need to keep you need to keep the commandments and i was like well i'm not an expert in in in, in irenaeus and anything like that uh, but one thing that he was trying to do was trying to say hey look see irenaeus said you need to keep the commandments so David, you need to keep the commandments. And I was like asking, well, what does he mean by that? Keep the commandments. Cause I don't think Irenaeus meant kept the law of Moses. And sure enough. And I, Sean, I would expect you to do better research on this before you even, you know, air that in, air, you know, 
talk about that. But Irenaeus didn't specifically mean that. Aaron, Irenaeus thought the commandments only specifically, and apparently most of the church fathers specifically thought that the, the commandments, when that was used, was specifically just to the Decalogue. And they make that very specific. They actually say that the law of Moses was, was is, is done away. So they're very clear. So I don't know where you're going with that. And if you, uh, truth doesn't work. Anyways, that, ask your questions better next time. Whatever. Thank you, David. And uh, Charles, if there's a, uh, anything final you want to say in that question, he did uh, leave something of clarification. He says, um, doing works doesn't save us in itself, but the spirit of obedience is still necessary and we need to obey. So Charles, we'll give you the last word. Okay. Because, he's, because he's because he's given a, a doctrinal theological question or statement, I'm going to give a doctrinal theological thing. I believe that whenever you're talking about the gospel, there's four areas that are attacked. The person, the work, the promise, and the requirement of salvation. The person that we're talking to right now, a philosophy, doesn't believe the person of Christ is God. Number two, he attacks the work of Christ. He does not believe in the penal substitution and atonement. Number three, he undercut, undercuts the promise of eternal life by placing conditions because he blurs distinction between the Mosaic law. And number four, he thinks the requirement is law keeping. I pray that he was saved at one point in time. So my point is, is regardless of whether I'm right or David's right, we both agree that you need to be saved by faith now. God bless. All right, gentlemen, we've made it. Great endurance from the both of you. I do uh, very much appreciate three plus hours of your time. You guys still look good. You look like you're ready for another three hour debate. So I don't know how you do it, but uh, thank you so much. And to the audience, thank you as well. This concludes another uh, week long debate marathon. It's been a ton of fun this, this week. This debate was awesome. Please share it around. Critical thinking is important. And that's why we come together you know, those with differing views and we engage in a sophisticated manner. This is important. So let's do some final words, final thoughts. Uh, David, let's start with you again. Thank you for being here. I look forward to more debates with you in the future on a variety of topics. So David, final words, final thoughts. I want to say thank you to all the Standing for Truth fans and listeners. I really appreciate you hanging on all the way to the end and enduring to the end. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's an honor for me to be here uh, and I'm very privileged and I'm thankful for it to, to be amongst you all and uh, for Donnie to allow me to do what I'm doing. Uh, this is the first time ever I've, you know, brought this out in, into a uh, debate format. I've never done that. So I took this very serious. Obviously, a little, obviously have some kinks to work on more, of a, you know, not you know, as far as communi communicating wise. I know there's definitely things I need to work on. I get it. Uh, but it just for me to have this opportunity to do this, it, it means it means the world to me. So I'm thankful. Uh, please understand that my goal is for you to fall in love with this book right here, with the one I'm holding in my hand, and uh, for you to uh, understand right division properly, and that you won't fall into this world of confusion, division, and doubt. And, and with that said, you know I wanted to say uh, again, thank you to Charles and Donnie. I appreciate you all. Uh, we, we, we want to learn, we want to grow, and that's why I sent you my slides. I know it was only two, three hours before, but still, uh, you know, usually I usually people don't do that, and I plan on doing that with my, most of my uh, future debates. And uh, hey, and everyone, please support support Donnie. You know, there's I'm I'm very critical of a lot of people who, who ask for money. Uh, one thing I've always appreciated about Dr. Dino is I'll never forget when I was younger. Uh, he would say, "You could print all. You, you can print. You can copy all." my videos and, and, and distribute them. And, and I took them at his word and that's what I did. I used to hand them to my professors. I used to hand them out when I used to do street ministry in Washington, DC. And I used to do all that. And, and Donnie has that same type of attitude, the same spirit. And here he is, man, we should be paying him. He's doing this for us. I mean, so Donnie, I, I just, again, I appreciate everything you do. Your ministry is legit. You're keeping the evolution and create and creation debate alive and you're letting ideas like this come forth. And again, thank you, and everyone have a blessed night. And by the way, Donnie, if you can, one last thing, I apologize. If Don't you could put my e put my email, if you could put my email, First John five seven, in the chat. Uh, every once in a while, I get someone reaches out to me. I didn't do this in this slide, uh, but please put my email in there. And look, if you want to reach out to me or anything and connect, do that. I don't have another channel. I don't have anything like that. Uh, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm hustling. I'm and and uh, nothing against those who do. But one day I will, and the day I do, I'll let everyone know for sure. Awesome. Uh, I very much appreciate those kind words. Uh, 
David, very nice. God bless. And if you want to give me your email, maybe in the private chat, and then I'll um, I'll paste it into the live chat. I can even put it in the description box as well. So uh, Charles, Charles Jennings, my good man, thank you so much for being here. I understand you're having a debate after show that uh, kicks off as soon as this one's over. So this is another all-nighter for you. Uh, Charles, again, thank you so much for doing this. I know how busy you are. I know how busy you both are. So some final words, final thoughts. Yeah, um, I appreciate this experience um, because it's going to help me write better, help me articulate things better, just as David was saying. I also appreciate that I'm even interacting with uh, David, with someone of his caliber. I mean, I learned a whole lot from watching that Kingdom of Context video about David as far as about, you know, being involved in debate. I don't know what, exactly what it is, but he, he's a professional in that sense, or at least he's been in a league or whatever. And so I don't have all the smooth, couth uh, statements and all of that, but I seek truth and I seek proper interpretation. And I know that's what David does as well. And, uh, you know, we have each other's emails. We have books from each other. And we're going to continue the process. SFT, of course, I appreciate what you've done for me, you know, giving me this platform, suckering me into debating, you know, for so long. Uh, the reason I like debating is because I like teaching. In teaching, I prepare something, and I love the audience. I never know what they're going to say. I never know what question you're going to have. I try to anticipate that. What debating is, not only are you preparing, but the other person is preparing, and you're trying to anticipate. And so, I, pre uh, you know, my channel grew by 5,000 views within the last three months. You know, my channel is nothing like uh, these debate channels. Uh, it's all about teaching Bible study methods and things like that. But you know what? I praise God that if people that are blessed here can be blessed there by looking at that content. And, and that's what this channel has allowed to happen is that your viewers are engaging that content. And so I praise God for that and, and how God's used you in that. God bless. Amen. God bless. Praise the Lord for uh, the growth of your channel and, you know, the outreach for uh, both David and Charles is why we host these debates. And I know that it takes uh, guts to enter the debate octagon. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. So I'm very, very happy with this debate community that we have built. And I can't thank the debaters enough because if it wasn't for people like you giving us your time, being so generous, we wouldn't have so many awesome debates. So, uh, David, I got your uh, a, a well-deserved drink of water. I've got your email in the chat for everybody. And uh, with that being said, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, that's another one in the books, as I like to say. So share it around. If you're not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button because we're just getting started here on Standing for Truth Ministries. And again, tomorrow's off, but we'll see you on Monday. Uh, God bless all. Standing for Truth is out.